This guy is into all different things. He's involved in content creation, sports, and he he helps a lot of people with their standardized tests as well. So if you guys want to hear more from him, please keep watching. All right, without further ado, meet Mr. Levsha. As soon as I started SAT, I stopped losing. I lo lost my interest in IELTS mm -hmm. because SAT at that time was really hard. Mm -hmm. You get to read a long text, just mm -hmm. like re IELTS reading, but it's more academic. It's rigorous. The books that you get to read, the past, the excerpts that you get to read are very hard. I have a little theory, a little conspiracy theory. Yep. I think they're in deliberately making population dumber so they can control all of us because they don't need they don't need smart people anymore because they got AI. George Orwell, Paris and London, he describes his experiences of poverty in London and Paris. And then you gradually go to philosophy. And when you start reading philosophy, especially Nietzsche, you get lost. That's a depressing experience. <laughs> I've, I've gone through it for two months. Uh -huh. Very isolated. You don't want to talk to anybody. I totally agree with you on that. Having an independent mind, being critical of things, you know, using your reasoning faculty, which I believe is a God-given gift, yeah. right? Which is something we humans have. The only creatures on this planet who possess that faculty is us. Yeah. Right? It's one of the reasons why we are dominating species on this planet. Yeah. Right? We're at the top of the food chain. I kept telling them, hey, there is a very high chance I will not get in. Okay, I tried my best. I was not sleeping. You, you, you saw what happened. I was living in the library. Most likely, it's not going to work out. And you ha it's not like you, you have to tell your parents before the results are out so they are okay with it. I Sometimes when I see my dad or mom doing some chores around the house, you know, I don't feel like helping them. And most people would think I'm a, being a bad son, yeah. but I'm not. It's those chores that give their life meaning. Yeah. Why take them away from them? It would be a disservice to them. Exactly. There's a flip side to it. It means that the people who use AI, who are good with using AI, can produce very good output, can prompt well, they get to be, they get to enjoy all the benefits. It's like being in the elite when there is a wide inequality, which there is now. That, that was one of the best podcasts we've ever had, okay? We, I usually have our editor guy rate the podcast once we're you know, done shooting, say yeah. that was my top two, that was my top three, that was my top one. The guy who just walked out, he's gonna be back in share his impressions about the podcast before we put this podcast out and get some feedback from people yeah right i, I don't care what he thinks but th this is in top top three <laughs> hey folks hey everyone welcome back to another episode of adoster muse i'm your host muhammad ali here Today, I'm going to be talking to an amazing guest. And the guy I'll be talking to is Mr. Asadbek Ismailov, also known as Levsha. He's a big guy on social media, and he goes to one of the top universities in the world, Hong Kong University of Technology. And this guy is into all different things. He's involved in content creation, sports, and he, he helps a lot of people with their standardized tests as well. So if you guys want to hear more from him, Please keep watching. All right. Without further ado, meet Mr. Levsha. Thanks for inviting, sir. Yeah. Welcome to Ad Astra Muse. So would you like to tell our audience a little about yourself, Mr. Levsha? Absolutely. Before I talk about myself, mm -hmm. I'd like to start with a quote. So there's this famous writer, Voltaire, and he said something following, something interesting. Is there anyone so wise as to learn from the experiences of others? And that quote was really profound to mm. me. I took two gap years. I took eight SATs. I took two IELTS exams. And I've made choices that others haven't made. And in this episode, I hope to share some of the most crucial lessons that I have learned throughout my journey. Mm -hmm. My name is Asadbek. You can call me Lifsha. I'm an athlete. I play rugby. I'm a five times national champion. Wow. I read philosophy. I like economics, uh -huh. and I also run multiple channels on social media. I have over 50,000 followers across social media. Thanks for inviting, sir. 
Wow. <laughs> how, old, how, how old are you, if that's uh, not a secret? I'm almost 19. He, this guy is almost 19, and he plays rugby. He runs marathons. He runs uh, platforms on social media with thou- tens of thousands of followers. Yeah. You're interested in philosophy. You've said the SAT test eight times. Yeah. I, that, that's, pretty, that, that's pretty impressive what you're doing here. 19, and you already got a lot, a lot of good stuff on your record. So now, you know, I will get to all those things in a bit, but before we do that, what do you say we take a step back and talk a little about your upbringing? Absolutely. Right. So you're originally from Fergana, right? Yes. So what was it like growing up in Fergana? Yeah, so my father is originally from Kokant, which is, to me, a cultural capital of our country. Mm -hmm. And he had an impressive um, upbringing. But he then moved to Fergana, where he met my mother. Mm -hmm. And then I was born in 2005. Mm -hmm. I started learning basically at around five. Mm -hmm. I learned the multiplications at five when I was Mm -hmm. five. Mm -hmm. And then I started going to a school nearby, Mm -hmm. a local school, which wasn't good, which wasn't impressive by any means. Mm -hmm. But I kept going to, you know, some additional courses like math and Russian and then when I reached the sixth grade, I told my parents, hey, I'm doing good, but I think something needs to be changed. Something needs to change. I'm doing good, but I don't see any change, any growth. Mm-hmm. I was winning Olympics. I was winning championships in sports, and I didn't see any growth. So I told them, what is it if we move to Tashkent? Mm-hmm. There's this famous blogger, Otabek Mahkamov. Mm-hmm. Perhaps you know him. And he basically went to my school in Fergana. Mm -hmm. And so the school was the same. And he, it turns out, came to Tashkent after graduating from ninth grade from the school to LIC. I'm not sure what it was, but I think it was gymnasium or something. Mm -hmm. But what I knew was he left Fergana after ninth grade. And then when he came to Tashkent, he started learning languages well. He learned like five languages, and then he also started reading more. And basically, his life has started being different. And I also thought that if I come to Tashkent, I would have very different experiences. I would meet different kinds of people. And then I started applying to lyceums, academic lyceums. So there are a few top academic lyceums. Uh, hang on a second. So you guys, you and your family moved to Tashkent upon the suggestion of a 13-year-old? I'm guessing at the time you were 12, 13. Yeah. And, uh, your entire, and your dad made the decision to uproot and move to Tashkent upon uh, the suggestion of his son. He didn't initially like the, the suggestion. Yeah. Uh, I told my mom and she liked it. She was also you know, kind of a fan of Otabek mm-hmm. Mahkamov. Mm-hmm. And she also wanted me to become a diplomat or some you know, important uh-huh. person. Uh-huh. And then I basically said, hey, we need to go. And I, we actually wanted to come to Tashkent after eighth grade mm-hmm. because, you know, I had nothing to improve in Fergana. Mm-hmm. And we came here, we looked for some schools, there were some top schools I could get in mm-hmm. because I knew, my English was fine, my mm-hmm. math was fine, and I could study well. Mm-hmm. But then my father disagreed. And then after ninth grade, mm-hmm. I started preparing for the admissions mm-hmm. to academic lyceums. Yeah. And then once I got in, he was over the moon, uh-huh. he was very happy. He told every relatives, you know, <laughs> it's kind of a status yeah. thing. And basically, I initially moved with my mother, mm-hmm. but then father came. Mm-hmm. I mean, still, you had a lot of courage to go up to your dad and tell him to, you want to move to Tashkent, and you want the entire family to come with you. And when I was your age, when I was that, that age, when I was 12, 13, I, I was afraid to ask my dad for <laughs> sweets, candies, much less ask him to come with me to Tashkent. So it takes some balls to go up to your dad and say, hey, I want something different in my life. I want to move to Tashkent. Come with me. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things that I thank my father, mostly independence. Uh-huh. Like he was a sportsman. His, mm-hmm. all, all of his brothers are sportsmen, athletes. His grandfather was a sportsman. Mm-hmm. And even though he liked me doing sports, mm-hmm. Whatever sport I would go, he would say, you don't need to win. You don't need to be the best at it. Mm-hmm. Just pursue it as something, as a passion, mm-hmm. you know, as a hobby. Mm-hmm. Don't make sports your major direction in life. 
even though he, he knew that I was capable. So I took some tests, and there, like, whatever sport I would go, I would be very fantastic at it. Mm -hmm. And even coaches would say, hey, you can go to the Olympics, to Olymp use Olympics games in mm -hmm. Argentina, in mm -hmm. some other country. And, and they really saw the potential. You, mm -hmm. At least, at the very least, you will go there. Mm -hmm. Like, if you train enough, you will go. And there is some chance that you can even win. But I didn't see sports as a good direction. I always chose academics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So academics. And what, at what age did you realize that? At what, what age you came to that realization? I think the realization mostly came when I started preparing for Academic Lyceum. Mm -hmm. I was basically preparing for around 8 to 10 hours every day. Mm -hmm. English and mass, English and mass. Mm -hmm. And I would go to the trainings in the morning, early mm -hmm. morning. There was COVID. Mm -hmm. We didn't have that much strictness there. Mm -hmm. And I would go out and, you know, policemen would see me. Mm -hmm. And I would also go to training uh, in the evening too. Mm -hmm. And coaches, you know, all, because my father is a coach, all, almost all coaches know me. And they would say, hey, what are you doing? And I would say, oh, just training, you know, for so fun. What, what would you train? Like lifting weights? Or? No, just run. Mostly running. run. Okay. Yeah. All right. I like running marathons. At that time, I was oh. a sprinter. I, I liked mm -hmm. running, you know, uh -huh. like you say in bold stuff, 100, uh -huh. 100 meters, oh, wow. 60 meters. Yeah. But then I, once I started, now, before we move on to the marathon, so mm -hmm. I was basically running and coaches would come up to me and say, hey, would you like to try? You can win the national championship over here. And mm -hmm. I would say, I would love to try, but I'm not, I'd, I'm not sure if I would be able to dedicate my full time. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to waste this chance and I want to give this to someone who wants to work hard for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and what happened once you guys moved to Tashkent? How, how, how life was different than Tashkent? What was your first impression when you moved to Tashkent? Did, what you, did you feel like lost because it's such a big city? No, what I immediately noticed was the pace. You know, uh -huh. it's very fast paced and I like it. Mm -hmm. I like moving fast. I like taking very fast decisions. For example, when you go out in the mm -hmm. metro, mm -hmm. you can go with people mm -hmm. or you can be smart enough to go to the first how do you call it? First part of the metro, mm -hmm. and then go out first. Like mm -hmm. if you're smart and fast, you can mm -hmm. you can figure out things very quickly. Mm -hmm. And I was smart. I was fast. I like mm -hmm. taking very fast decisions, moving yeah. fast. And that thing that uh, it really impressed me mm -hmm. that people don't wait for things to happen; they make it happen. Wow, that's so true. As someone who lived in both cities, in Bukhara and some and, and, and Tashkent, I can I can confidently say in Tashkent things are a lot faster right and but I, I'm a kind of guy who likes to take things slow and that's one of the reasons why I moved back to Bukhara because things are much simpler here yeah. like on our way here there's not much traffic yeah. <laughs> but when you're in Tashkent it's it's buzzing with people it's buzzing with car everyone is rushing to work school and they're you know sports training or whatever right life is moving so fast it feels like you never have the moment, you know, to sit down and think and reflect. But I'm I'm a kind of a guy who likes to reflect, who needs to take his time, right? He doesn't want to be pushed, forced. But I also like the fact that uh, when I was in Tashkent, I learned how to be more decisive, like you said. Like you have to be quick-minded. You have to have quick decision-making skills, right? And, and, and that's actually the place where you want to be in. You want to be, you want to have a mix of, you know, that immediacy, urgency, and at the same time, uh, be a little reflective on what's going on, right? Yeah. Because if you lean too, lean too much to one side, right, you, you're a little too fast, too immediate, you make terrible decisions. Yeah. And you're too reflective, you, get, you overthink, yeah. right? You're too slow to make decisions, and someone comes and beats you, right? So... That, that's good. Living in Tashkent teaches you a lot of things, right? And one, and one more uh -huh. thing that I have noticed is people have different interests. Uh -huh. When I was in Fergana, what people would do is either learning English, mm -hmm. learning math, basically academics, right? Or going to some sports. Some kind of elite sort would go to art. But in general, like these three were the type of things that people would do. But when I came to Tashkent, I discovered that there were so much, there's so much more that I could do. 
in my second months, I started going to a modeling course in Tashkent. Mm -hmm. Like when I was 14, who could have imagined that I would go to a modeling course and try <laughs> myself in modeling? It was going pretty well, but I, you know, again started focusing on academics. But, but, but well, hang, on, hang on a second, what was it like doing a modeling course? Is it, would you do like catwalk, come on stage? Yeah, we tried wearing, everything. Wearing yeah. clothes. Yeah, one thing that was most interesting was so yeah. in our group we had 15 or 17 girls uh -huh. and three boys. Uh -huh. And that already pushed me to, you know, kind of get rid of my social anxiety and uh -huh. try myself in it. Uh -huh. I would come even though I was not confident uh -huh. in myself. Yeah. And what would, what would they guys make you do? Like just stand like a mannequin on stage or just now we, most, around Mostly stage? basic stuff like uh, doing the stages, poses, mm -hmm. catwalking. Mm -hmm. And what's your favorite pose? I, I like the classic one. Uh-huh. So it's like when you just walk straight into the stage. Yeah. Right. Classic one standing there, uh -huh. has my hands in the pocket, uh -huh. and then basically turning around and coming yeah. back. Yeah, and great thing about modeling is you get, you get to try different clothes, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, that's one yeah. of the things that I liked. Right, right. So what happened then? Once you did modeling and decided that's not your thing, so you no, decided to drop it. No, I just it. had so much going on in my life. Uh -huh. I started running different projects. I had mm -hmm. my channel, mm -hmm. and then on top of that, I started preparing for SAT, <coughs> which was in itself enough to completely cover my time mm -hmm. and so once I so it was a three months course I finished it and I was like thank you I learned mm -hmm. one skill in the pocket mm -hmm. I didn't regret it yeah so if right now anyone comes to you with a million dollar offer and say hey can you come model for us you do it you have course, the skills for it, right? Why not? Right? If you pay me, as long as it's ethical, yeah. we're going to find a way to yeah, figure it out. Yeah, yeah. Because a lot of people would think that it's not culturally acceptable for men to, to do that, to go into this profession like singing, acting, and modeling. But uh, that's what, what's great about Tashkin. And all these people are more liberal minded. They encourage you to yeah. try different things, have different experiences. Uh, my actually a former employer used to take tango dance classes. Oh. And I think like he must be out of his mind. Like, cause I, I honestly don't like dancing myself. Like, and it's so bizarre imagining a man dancing on stage, even though I like it when I see ladies dance, I'm just not accustomed to seeing men dance on the stage. It's just a little yeah. liberating, you know? Uh -huh. You're, you're always under pressure to do what society expects you. You mm -hmm. have to work hard and mm -hmm. have good SAT or IELTS course. You have to get into a university. You have mm -hmm. to have good amount of money. Mm -hmm. and whatever you do, most of the things that people do is just because society expects them. Mm -hmm. And trying yourself in things where you're free to do what you want, of course, you will have some sort of boundaries, mm -hmm. but as long as you're doing what you really want, it can be, you know, fishing mm -hmm. or some other thing. It's really liberating when you can move your body freely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you have you have that in Tashkent, right? You have all yeah. these opportunities. Yeah, so so many opportunities. Yeah. And that's what's you know actually great about Uzbekistan. This is where West and East converges. Yeah, and people say it's Turkey, but you can find some of that in Tashkent as well. Yeah, right. Yeah, you get a little bit of that conservatism and liberalism, and that's just a perfect balance. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, we, 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 we talked quite a bit about your upbringing. And what do you say we talk, you know, touch on your educational experiences? Absolutely. Because you said you got a lot of experience doing standardized tests. Yeah. And the bulk of our audience here watching this podcast because they want to learn some tips yes. and tricks from different people uh, who've tried SAT and IELTS and they'd love to hear from you as well what yeah. your experience of taking SAT and IELTS was like. So yeah, uh, what do you say we start off with IELTS and then talk about SAT? Because that's the order in which yeah, students course. usually do it, right? You, yeah, you, but one thing I, I have to say is uh -huh. people wait for their IELTS to improve and mm. then start SAT. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's true. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a right path because I myself took SAT first and then took IELTS second. Wow. Uh, that's, that, that's, a, that's a controversial thing to say. You know why? Because all the SAT guys I had on the podcast kept telling me that you have to get your IELTS first, mm -hmm. be, you know, get at least seven, and then go into SAT. Don't think about going into SAT unless you have that seven in your pocket. Right? Seven knowledge. Mm -hmm. 
Seven knowledge. The knowledge right? that is equal to seven. But you need that confirmation, right, from a credible source. You need that confirmation. No, from as long as you, as long as you really com- know, confident. Th- it's just as long as you're, uh-huh. it's, as long as you know that you have mm. knowledge that is equal to seven, mm. that's fine. You don't really need a certificate. Yeah, I see. It's, it's just people, students, you know, teenagers need that confirmation anyway. Yeah. It's it's just harder to to, to do than you know say, because. With, with, you know what it's like with a lot of teenagers, they have confidence issues. They yeah. always seek validation from their seniors, their teachers, and some testing authority like IELTS, TOEFL, right? And only then they become convinced that they're ready for SAT. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, back to your experience. So, how did it go? So, you said you first did IELTS. Sure. SAT, right? Yeah. Sure. sure. We, well, let's talk about SAT first then. Yeah, so first was preparing for IELTS, and mm-hmm. then as soon as I started SAT, I stopped losing, I lo- lost my interest in IELTS. Mm-hmm. Because SAT at that time was really hard. Mm-hmm. You get to read a long text, just mm-hmm. like re- IELTS reading, but it's more academic, it's rigorous. The books that you get to read, the, past, the excerpts that you ha- get to read are very hard. And even though it was multiple choice, it's not like... If A is right, B and C and D must be wrong. It's not like that. It's B and C and D are less strong than A. <laughs> so you get to have this, that sort of inference. You develop your reasoning. Yeah. So that's a very hard thing. Yeah. And my introduction to SAT was very interesting. Because mm-hmm. in, when I was doing IELTS and I was getting you know, 8, 8.5 without much struggle, but as soon as I started SAT, I got lost. Mm-hmm. I got broken. I mm-hmm. thought I was good at English. Mm-hmm. And then I found that there are some things that I was not exposed to. Mm-hmm. And then the things that you read mm-hmm. in SAT were very interesting. Mm-hmm. For example, so there, there were five parts of SAT mm-hmm. in English. We're, we're, we're going to start from English, right? It was natural sciences. There is some history. There's some literature. There are some social stuff, social science. So you get to read different kinds of passages at once, right, in one hour. And you get to be exposed to different levels of writing. First, you read a research paper. Mm -hmm. Your mind is blown. Mm -hmm. What is it talking about? Mm -hmm. And then you start reading social science. The language is good, understandable. You're understanding everything. But the question, it's not even tricky. It's asking, obviously, but Mm. it's asking for an inference. Mm -hmm. You get to infer what the passage is saying. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you, for a moment, explain to our audience what, what inferences? Because they may not, might not have clue what inferences. Yeah. So. For example, let me give you an example. That's the most mm-hmm. common example. Mm-hmm. If there is rain, mm-hmm. then the uh, mm, ground must be wet, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. But that's an inference. That's not a fact. Mm-hmm. There might be a car, mm-hmm. and if the ground that we're talking about mm-hmm. is under the car, mm-hmm. it may not be wet. Mm-hmm. But we, for the, for the sake of the argument, are going to assume or infer in this case mm-hmm. that the ground is wet because it's raining. Mm-hmm. So that's like inference. Mm-hmm. If it's saying mm-hmm. uh, there, it was raining mm-hmm. and then the man was doing something, you can infer that the ground was wet mm-hmm. and develop the argument further and mm-hmm. understand what mm-hmm. the author is trying to say. So it's very much like deductive thinking. It's yeah, like. when you like extract the hidden message based on the information facts at hand. That, that's right. one of the questions that it asks. There mm-hmm. are obviously some other questions that are more obvious. Mm-hmm. But that, that, just doing that kind of inference stuff develops your reasoning, develops your logic. Mm-hmm. And you get to really mm-hmm. talk to people more mm-hmm. deeply. Mm-hmm. And I actually have another great example because I teach my students as well so-called inference-based reading, yep. or, but I like to phrase it deductive thinking, but I think there, there's an overlap. They're much yeah. more or less the same thing, right? Yeah. The example I usually give my students is the tower example. So you have three towers, tower A, tower B, and tower C. Mm-hmm. And tower B is taller than tower A. Mm-hmm. Tower C is taller than tower B. Mm-hmm. And you have true, false, not given question. Mm. Tower A is shorter than Tower C. Mm. Right. And yeah. what, what a lot of students would think is the answer is not given because there's no comparison between Tower A and C. Yeah. Right. We did compare Tower 
B and A. We did compare t- tower C and B, but we didn't directly compare tower A and C. Yeah. But if you use a little bit of deductive and inference-based thinking, you could figure out that tower C is the tallest, right? If it's the tallest, it must be taller than our tower, other yep. towers. Yep. So if it's taller than our other towers, that includes A as well. So A must be shorter than tower C. Yeah, right? and, and when, when you start making mm-hmm. those kinds of inference very often, mm-hmm. we can read books mm-hmm. that are hard to read, mm-hmm. that, have so, that have so many messages in there. Mm-hmm. For example, imagine opening a book by Abdullah Kadiri, let's mm-hmm. say. Uh, Gandhi spy mm-hmm. or whatever the name was, Utkan Kullar. Mm-hmm. When you read it, you might think that the uh, protagonist mm-hmm. is just saying something that is cultural, mm-hmm. showing respect for his father. Mm-hmm. But maybe if you start reading through inferences, mm-hmm. reading through the messages, you might understand that he was communicating something in a way that would that the adversaries, that the people listening mm-hmm. to him. Mm-hmm would not understand, mm-hmm. right? You get to understand the messages, yeah. different messages. And there were a lot of books written during the times where there was severe censorship. Mm-hmm. Like Abdullah Kadiri wrote, there was some um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn and mm-hmm. different writers who wrote very deep books. Mm-hmm. And you get to see what it says. Yeah, You get to appreciate the beauty of writing. Mm-hmm. And that's what you get from SAT, right? This SAT reading. Yeah. Right. And so would you recommend that students read some you know, extra, extra materials outside the SAT practice test, or they can, they're, they're fine with the SAT practice materials. Yeah, so that's what I was saying was in the old SAT. Mm-hmm. That was my first story of being introduced to SAT. But then SAT has changed. Mm-hmm. Now we have digital SAT. It's mm-hmm. not like the past SAT. Now the excerpts are smaller. Mm-hmm. You get this kinds of one or two paragraphs, mm-hmm. you read it, and if you're, you know, reasonable enough, mm-hmm. you can pretty much at least guess it correctly. Uh-huh. With the old part, you cannot even find where the answer is. Uh-huh. It's hard. So what you're saying is SAT got easier. Pretty much. It's like YouTube, uh-huh. you, you, got, you had sh- long videos, uh-huh. and then you got TikTok. Uh-huh. So it's like TikTokization. Uh-huh. That's what uh, one of our teachers, Valera, told. Mm-hmm. When she first so y- you're, you're saying that it, that's a bad change? I think so, because that's in the past, when I was mm-hmm. preparing, when uh, the other kids in mm-hmm. my generation were preparing, I'm, I'm old, mm-hmm. my generation, okay. <laughs> uh, we would say, if a person had 650 in, in, in the English section of SAT, mm-hmm. we would say, oh, wow, you're really pre- you, you have really prepared. And if he had anything that is higher than 700, mm-hmm. hey, man, <laughs> respect. Yeah, completely respect. It's like IELTS 9. Like, because you can get in if you yeah. have 700. It really shows yeah. your academic preparedness for college. Uh-huh. It shows that you can handle the rigor at college, at mm-hmm. university. But now you, you get to have people having uh, SAT English that's higher than 700 plus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But then when the person is speaking, you, you don't really believe. Mm-hmm. Did he cheat or SAT got different? Mm-hmm. And I think that SAT mm-hmm. got different. Okay, so then why would you think the the big guys, the uh, the guys running SAT, would make that change? Do you think they didn't think of that? Do you think that they would that would that would lower the bar for a lot of people and lower the level of academic excellence or make students less competitive? Yeah, I, right? th- I think they were intentional. Yeah. To my knowledge, there's severe. There has been severe debate around SAT for around a century at this point. Mm -hmm. People from low-income families in the U.S., black people, you know, Native Mm -hmm. Americans, mostly get lower scores Mm -hmm. than others, right? Minority groups, we're talking about, right? And what they say is SAT is designed in such a way as to oppress, as to discriminate black people because Black people, native people, minorities always get a score that is lower than white people, than Asian people. Yeah. Why is that? It's discrimination. Here we go again, folks. Here we go again. (laughs) That's what they say. And now that it's easier, black folks also start getting higher scores. Uh And they start, you know, getting into universities. Mm -hmm. They kind of want to express, uh, to my understanding. Sympathy towards. Giving a chance to black people. But I, I don't think it's having 
direct effect. I think it's being co counterproductive mm -hmm. because in the past you had if 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 it was completely normal, mm -hmm. you have ten people who get fifteen hundred, mm -hmm. but if the black hole gets fourteen fifty, mm -hmm. he is still you know qualified. He mm -hmm. can handle the rigor because mm -hmm. at fourteen fifty to my believe it starts you know the, the person starts being really rigorous he can read the challenging books mm -hmm. but now you have 100 white people with over 1500 mm -hmm. and the black folks still may have 1500 but in comparison still white people will be doing better because it, it's not it's not a fair game right mm -hmm. so i think it had a counterproductive impact but we're not gonna who were who are we to challenge college board i actually <coughs> i have a little Theory, a little conspiracy theory. Yep. I think they're in deliberately making population dumber so they can control all of us because they don't need they don't need smart people anymore because they got AI, right? Yeah. yeah. So they can have this robot do everything. Yeah. They want total control. That's what they want. Like that's a part of their like a fifty year or hundred year strategy. Maybe not this generation. Maybe not the next generation. But in like three four generations, you'll have. A bunch of people with no reasoning, with no critical thinking, right? With no independent mind, right? Because everything got got so so easy, that and there's not much you know to control because everyone is so gullible, suggestible, agreeable, right? They just believe whatever you say because they don't take the time to think, or cr critically analyze what you are saying, evaluate the incoming information. So don't you think it's it's that the, all these you know big the elites the ruling class intentionally deliberately cha changing the education system so they can have more control over us? <laughs> all right, I might. In in the face this, of it, I think it's more giving a chance to minorities to uh -huh. get into colleges so that there mm -hmm. are more people from uh, first generation students. So mm -hmm. if you're a first generation student, meaning you're parents and grandparents didn't go to college. Mm -hmm. If you're going, if you're applying, you, you have way more chances. Mm -hmm. like your chances increase by fourfold. Mm -hmm. First generation people, minorities, and underrepresented people, basically. But deep down, do I believe that there is some conspiracy going on? I'm not sure. Yeah, right. Now I'm just messing with you guys, okay? Yeah, <laughs> this I'm is not, not sure. a fact, okay? We're just... People bluffing. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm just bluffing here. Yeah, okay, I'm just bluffing here. I just want to play the devil's advocate. Yeah, <laughs> that's all I'm doing here. It's fine. All right. Okay. What, what what some suggestions you have for SAT students cramming for their exam right now? Do you have any you know tips, tricks, any shortcuts? Because they're they're always looking for shortcuts. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna tell you my story. So if you're yeah. just starting out and you have some time, like mm -hmm. as I did, I had. So I started preparing. In 2020, January, I believe. No, December, 2020, December. And I started in the course with people around me. So that, you know, it was fun mm -hmm. at the beginning. So if you are just starting out to make sure that the process is not overwhelming, mm -hmm. start with people. Mm -hmm. Because you'll get to have fun, you get to learn together. Mm -hmm. But once you reach some stage, mm -hmm. perhaps it will be wise to start being more isolating because mm -hmm. when you're isolated you get to see only yourself you get to analyze yourself and only mm -hmm. you, you, you'll not be wasting a lot of time joking around you know laughing mm -hmm. if you if your score is not improving you should not be laughing mm -hmm. i mean like goofing around a lot of students do yeah right? that's what people, they're stuck on yeah I, I would be in the library mm -hmm. 10 hours i'm doing the practice test i'm doing three practice tests 700 700 700 Mm -hmm. Not improving. Taking the test, 680. Mm -hmm. Four times straight. Mm -hmm. Why is it happening? Because I have people around. I, I, see. I don't need a mentor. I don't need a teacher. I don't need anything. I just have to be alone, mm -hmm. do this thing, mm -hmm. and then analyze. My biggest mistake was I was doing the practice test, mm -hmm. but I was not analyzing. Mm -hmm. So it's more important to analyze your mistakes than mm -hmm. actually practicing, doing the practice test. Mm -hmm. And regarding the question about reading additional resources for SAT, that's what I actually did. I didn't really prepare for SAT in my last exam because I thought I was well accustomed. I took the test seven times. But the digital SAT was my first time. Mm -hmm. So I was not sure if I would be good with the new version. But what I did was 
nothing really, almost nothing related to the ICT. Mm -hmm. What I did was I opened a study group. So I have my channel, and I announced an application for a study group. What we would do is basically wake up at 5 a.m. each day, every day, two, two weeks in advance, two weeks before the exam. We formed the study group, and we would wake up at 5 a.m. and read books that are challenging. We would read philosophy, literature, economics, social science, different kinds of can, books. Can you drop names of some of, the, some of your favorites right now? Because I know there are some students taking notes. Um, your favorites. If, if you're just starting out, basic economics would be the same. Mm -hmm. if you, you can learn about economics, you can learn how the state controls the money, mm -hmm. how, you're, how, how unfair the system is, basically. Mm -hmm. It's designed not just for you. So you learn supply and demand, market dynamics, different stuff. Uh, basic economics, if you're just starting out, then you can proceed to a little more books, like literature books. Mm -hmm. We got George Orwell, 1984, and... What was the name? There was another book related to London and Paris. You can look it up. George Orwell, Paris and London. He describes his experiences of poverty in London and Paris. And then you gradually go to philosophy. And when you start reading philosophy, especially Nietzsche, you get lost. That's a depressing experience. <laughs> I've, I've gone through it for two months, uh -huh. very isolated. You don't want to talk to anybody. Huh. You, you don't know what, you, so you're basically starting to question. So that's, this is a black cup. Uh -huh. Why is it black? Uh -huh. <laughs> and, then, and then you, instead of answering the question, yeah. you start asking another question. Why are you asking why, why is it black? Yeah. And then it just, it's, it's, it's just a trend. You just and go then, down a rabbit hole yeah. of just thinking and questioning everything. Yeah. You're, why do I leave? What's the purpose of my existence? Yeah. In the, in, mm -hmm. You might be familiar with the Stoics, right? Mm -hmm. Don't look at the outcome. As long as you're putting in, everything mm -hmm. is fine. Mm -hmm. And then Nietzsche writes, uh, as Stoics say, don't be emotional. Mm -hmm. Like different things, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then Nietzsche starts criticizing all of the Stoics. Uh -huh. In one, in one, uh, not, not one, two pages. Uh, uh, which one, his, one of his criticisms of Stoics. So Stoics say you have to adhere to the principles of the nature. Uh -huh. And then Nietzsche says, isn't life, isn't being human about being in control of what your natural instincts are? Mm -hmm. Isn't being human about being just, about being forgiving when a person makes a mistake? Mm -hmm. If we start becoming more natural, we'll ha our natural instincts are different. For example, there is a guy who might have a passion for boys, a okay. boy for boy. Uh -huh. Th that might be natural, not really propaganda. There uh -huh. were some people. If he starts being natural, he might you know, do some stuff that is not accepted. Mm -hmm. um, for, and the judges. Judges may have a natural feeling to kill the person who killed another person, mm -hmm. but judges should not, do, should not be as such. Mm -hmm. They should be just, they should be fair. They should look at the constitution, at the law, and then decide mm -hmm. what to do. So it's not about being natural. You mm -hmm. need to use reason. You need to be humane. Yeah. But Stokes do also argue that you have to have self-control, right? Isn't that quite similar to what Nietzsche describes? Like having self-control is like if you are that judge who feels tempted to kill the person who killed another guy, who murdered yeah. another guy, yeah. and you control that feeling, so you do have self-control, which is one of the attributes of a Stoic. Yeah, and then you, you turn to Nietzsche, uh -huh. and he describes it in such a way where you don't understand. Uh -huh. Okay. You, you, you're understanding mm -hmm. every word, but you're not understanding mm -hmm. what it's saying. But what if... Uh, all right, here's what I think. I'm just going to go, go out on a limb and say this. Sometimes a lot of these philosophers don't know what they're saying. <laughs> yeah. I, honestly. Because I I, I, I their minds are so messed up. Maybe we're just too dumb to understand, but here's what I think. Okay. It's, they're simply sharing with us their observation of the universe, right? And that's, and, and that's not necessarily the ultimate truth. Yes, we should read them for intellectual amusement, but... If something is not clear and you try your best to understand it and it still doesn't add up, just let it go. But what is truth? Uh -huh. The truth. Nietzsche asked, what is truth? Well, 
the we, tend, we tend to regard white and black as opposites. Uh -huh. Where did you get this from? Is physics. It, is it because it's opposite or because the society, because humans perceive it as opposite? It, that's simple physics. That, that, that's the way I see it. So light is usually white is because it's not actually white. It's when, you, when it hits the, a prism, it splits into seven different colors, I guess, right? So you can, and that's, that's backed up by science. Like it's not, mm -hmm. sci, sci, for example, again, mm -hmm. even, even if you claim one plus one is two, mm -hmm. it's again going to be subjective. It's, mm -hmm. It goes back all the time to completely subjective oh, statements. Actually, this one is less mm -hmm. subjective yeah. and plus one, one plus one is also subjective. Uh -huh. But whatever claim you can make. So you're saying one plus one, one plus one is not two? You're no. suggesting one plus one. He's suggesting one plus one no, may not, not be two. No, he's not saying that. He's yeah. saying, where did you get the idea that one plus one is two? It's mm -hmm. because some human said it was two. Mm -hmm. And he didn't mention one plus one. Actually, he mentioned some things, mm -hmm. opposite, some different things. Mm -hmm. Is, um, what was it? Cold opposite to hot. Mm -hmm. Is it? it? It is, yeah. But that's what humans perceive. Yeah. Physic, from the physics, perspe physics perspective, there mm -hmm. is no cold. Mm -hmm. It's just less hot. Okay. If I'm not confusing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. You can. It's about how you phrase it. Yes. Yeah. You can. You can rephrase it and say that. Yeah. So he says basically, uh -huh. everything is subjective. Yeah. All your ideals, mm -hmm. all your beliefs, mm -hmm. they come from places where you don't even know. Mm -hmm. For example, parents perceive. Mm -hmm. um, they might perceive gap year as something inherently bad, you're mm -hmm. wasting your time, mm -hmm. you're a failure, you mm -hmm. didn't get into university. Mm -hmm. But it's, where did they get this idea from? From their parents. And they, where, where did they, where they, they, they got it from other people. <laughs> so he, so he, he encourages people to question everything. Yeah. And then you start yeah. questioning, you go out and say, uh -huh. why is this guy mm -hmm. X or Y? Mm -hmm. You question everything. And then the worst part is when you start questioning yourself, mm -hmm. your identity. Mm -hmm. But you see, for this reason, don't you think we need some commonly, you know, agreed upon, like, you know, universal truths, like we need some uh, guidelines, principles we all can abide by so we can keep the civilization together from falling apart. Because if you had a, 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 a contingent of people, a whole lot of people with that way of thinking or overcritical of everything yeah we'd have rebellious population you'd have Absolutely. you'd have people and before you know what our society would collide would collapse and <coughs> collapse into chaos all right we'd collapse into madness yeah from the societal <coughs> perspective it would be chaos but from the individual perspective you would not uh -huh. want to be a ship mm -hmm. You want to be a critical thinker mm -hmm. who can understand, can question what the government is doing, yeah, and why is it doing. But at the same time, you gotta try to be a good soldier. You see, because because with humans, yes, it, things are always complicated, right? Imagine this: you have a boss, and your boss is not. You think your boss is not fair, right? Yeah. And you sk speak up, yeah, right. But. Do you ever give your boss the benefit of the doubt and assume that he might be doing his best to help you keep your job when he criticizes you? Maybe he's saying, making that criticism because he has your best interest in mind, because he wants, in the long term, he wants you to get, step out of your comfort zone, work, get better, right? Take that criticism. Yeah. So rather than getting back at your boss, right? which is something irrational because you're, you're trying to be a critical thinker, because you're trying to stick out, Yeah, right? People have this idea that questioning and critiquing mm -hmm. are bad things. Mm -hmm. Questioning does not necessarily mean you're looking for negative sides. Mm -hmm. And the same goes with critiquing. Mm -hmm. For example, if you start critiquing, writing a critique on a book you read, mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you are going to talk about, you're going to criticize it. Criticizing and critiquing and questioning are different things. Mm -hmm. Criticizing is only doing the bad stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Not doing, but uh, looking for the bad things. Mm -hmm. But critiquing and questioning will involve breaking down things into what they are. Mm -hmm. You clarify. You write things. Mm -hmm. hey, he says here this. Mm -hmm. Then he said this. Mm -hmm. If these two are self-contradictory, mm -hmm. We might start questioning. He said that he was here mm -hmm. at this time, 
But then in the next day, he appears in North America. Mm -hmm. How did he go? Did he mm -hmm. go by plane mm -hmm. in 10th century? Mm -hmm. How? Mm -hmm. Start questioning. It doesn't mean that it's bad. It's just clarifying if the thing mm -hmm. is, you know, as it stands for. Mm -hmm. And for, your, for that critique to be valid, you have to still abide by some commonly accepted truths. Yes. The commonly accepted facts. Yes. And which is something you said Nietzsche crit critiqued, right? Like, is black really black? Or is white really white? Or yeah. is, is cold really cold? What if it's so? You see, all of these, you know, assumptions, all of these comments he makes. Nietzsche, right? Yeah. Uh, as much as I respect him, unnecessarily valid. That's that's all I'm trying to say. Yeah, completely. Yeah. It's again, it goes back to your ability mm -hmm. to separate what is bad, mm -hmm. what is valid, mm -hmm. what is interesting, and mm -hmm. what is good. Mm -hmm. When you read philosophy, you don't have to accept all the points. Whatever book you read, whatever mm -hmm. opinion you mm -hmm. listen to, you may have heard about my tips, uh, my tip that you have to take SAT first and then pay attention to IELTS. Mm -hmm. That's controversial. You don't have to take it, but you can take some other points that were useful. Mm -hmm. And the same goes with reading Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. He may have written some controversial stuff. He may believe that God has died. Mm -hmm. You don't have to say that. Oh, he literally said that. Yes, it's God is that. That's uh -huh. what he said. You don't have to accept that, mm -hmm. but he is certainly not dumb. Mm -hmm. At some point, he may say something that is interesting, that mm -hmm. is worth paying attention to. Mm -hmm. So when you read philosophy, you start to be very questioning about things mm -hmm. and you don't have to question everything you just have to question on time right for mm -hmm. example if the government if our government wants to join wto world trade organization we may ask a question why why don't we have to defend our own small businesses mm -hmm. perhaps it would be wise to not accept foreign large corporate corporations like google and other co co companies that will destroy that will wipe out all the small businesses mm -hmm. You ask questions, right? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be bad. Mm -hmm. It's just inherent curiosity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and if you don't actually, if you don't listen, you will start perceiving, you will start thinking of all the news that you hear to be true. Like imagine reading BBC and the BBC says, hey, it's okay to express your feelings mm -hmm. as, as they are. It's okay to love women if you're mm -hmm. a woman. It's mm -hmm. okay to be friendly with people who don't mm -hmm. believe in God. Different opinions, right? Oh, I'm not oh. saying they're bad. What I'm saying is you have to uh -huh. be able to question and discern what is good and what is bad. Uh -huh. Right, right. Or, or, or in some cases, well, like back in COVID, when we had COVID, WHO, World Health Organization, yeah. literally said video games are healthy. <laughs> it's healthy to stay home and play video games. <laughs> Do you know that masks That's don't work? <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. They don't work. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not saying criticize WHO or uh, UN or everything. Yeah. Just know yeah. for yourself. Yeah. Don't follow into the trap. Mm -hmm. It's easy to be manipulated, especially uh -huh. here, for example, people have, you know, like-minded mm -hmm. religion, faith, mm -hmm. beliefs, mm -hmm. common sense, and they follow by but, Which are good things. Yeah, I'm not yeah. saying they're bad. Yeah. But if you go to Hong Kong, uh -huh. you get to eat, uh, you know, perha perhaps you will they will ask you to eat, you know, living animals. Uh -huh. Or pork. Without even killing, you know, or pork, uh -huh. for that matter. Uh -huh. Are you going to, hey, it's, it turns out it's okay. Or mm. you're, are you going to question that? Hey, mm. is it okay uh, according to my belief sets mm -hmm. or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, for sure. I wholeheartedly agree with you on that. Having an independent mind, being critical of things. You know, using your reasoning faculty, which I believe is a God-given gift, yeah. right? Which is something we humans have. The only creatures on this planet who possess that faculty is us. Yeah. Right? It's one of the reasons why we are dominating species on this planet. Yeah. Right? We're at the top of the food chain now. And yeah, for sure, you have to be curious. You have to ask questions and wonder. But at the same time, you have to have some, you know, beliefs and customs that you want to abide by so you don't get knocked in the wrong direction because human mind is a dark place human yeah. mind is a maze okay right you start out with good intentions yeah. but road to hell was paid with 
good intentions. You ever heard that quote? Road to hell was yeah. paid with good intentions. Right. So you got to be careful, okay, when you're playing this game, mind uh, game. Yeah. And that's when the mentor comes into play. Uh -huh. That's the importance of a mentor. Uh -huh. Alexander the Great had a mentor who was Aristotle. Mm -hmm. Plato listened to Socrates. Mm -hmm. The greatest people listen to the greatest people. And people, especially in our generation, I get to see a lot of people and say, I can do this myself. Mm -hmm. I don't need friends, even some people mm -hmm. say. I don't need mentor. I can pull it off myself. Mm -hmm. That is true. That is possible. But hey, first, will you be able to? Mm -hmm. Which is very unlikely. People say, for example, in our case, in our community, people say, I can get into Harvard without mm -hmm. any mentor, without any help, without any money, even. Mm -hmm. First, you're likely not going to achieve it. Second, at what expense are you going to do it? At what cost will you sacrifice your sleep, your health, mm -hmm. your beliefs? Mm -hmm. Will you start identifying yourself as someone who you're not mm -hmm. just for the sake of getting in? Mm -hmm. And third, what are going to be are, are the uh, uh, consequences? If you achieve this, let's think, mm -hmm. will you be able to navigate mm -hmm. at the university? Because mm -hmm. here it's okay. When you're reading alone, mm -hmm. you may question and then perhaps go in the wrong direction, mm -hmm. but you will have friends who will take you back, right? Mm -hmm. In university, you will not listen. Only professors, you, you will only be trusting professors and other people, and you start questioning, and you're not going to listen to people. Mm -hmm. So in, university is a very dangerous place because mm -hmm. you are reading very challenging things. You're reading Nietzsche. You're reading the critique of religions, mm -hmm. of philosophers. Mm -hmm. Incoher there's a book called Incoherence of Philosophers. Mm -hmm. So you're both criti critiquing and criticizing both religion, philosophy, and then sciences, mm -hmm. and then social sciences. And then on top of that, you have people who are studying gender studies, <laughs> different kinds of people. Who should you believe? You will yeah. be disoriented. Your mind will yeah. be blown. Yeah. And to make sure that you do not have <coughs> such problems, you have to have some sort of mentor. At least if you're a freshman, talk to a sophomore there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At the very least. But in general, I recommend people get a mentor. Yeah. So uh, first off, I want to make sure that your mic is recording. Guys, can you make sure his mic is recording right now? Because we had technical problems in the past. Uh, yeah, sure. That's a lot of good content. And I, I just want to make sure this mic is picking everything yeah. up. Okay. Right. So you said it's important to get a mentor, right? And yeah, just one moment. Yo, we just, we got another guest in the house. Hey, huh. hey everybody, how's it going? So you said it's important to have a mentor, right? Who was your mentor or who is your mentor? You want to talk about your own mentor a little and give him some credit? Yeah. And, and please make sure you're speaking to the mic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I had a few mentors, not mentors, but teachers. Mm -hmm. I had Abdulaziz Sharapov who mm -hmm. introduced me to SAT, taught me SAT. Mm -hmm. And then I had Valera and then I had a lot of friends who got in mm -hmm. who put some effort into mm -hmm. my growth, right? Mm -hmm. But in general, in the admissions sphere, I generally navigated it myself. Mm -hmm. I would look up to resources, different resources, read articles, you know, talk to ChatGPT and other stuff. In general, I did it all by myself. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, I think I, I could do more if I had a mentor. And that's why I advise people to have mentors. Mm -hmm. And people question this because it's expensive. For example, mm -hmm. for a person to book a consultation with me, it's going to cost at least 20 bucks mm -hmm. for 15 minute or a half, a, half an hour call, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it's expensive. At least it's going to be $500. Mm -hmm. But what I say is, if your parents can afford, like even if just afford, mm -hmm. I'm not saying they should be rich. Mm -hmm. If they can afford, I recommend they take it. Mm -hmm. It's going to be valuable. At the very least, even if they don't help you at all, at college you can ask, hey, they are saying I should, what, what courses should you take? You, should you start from linear algebra, which is a very hard concept, algebra, or you should start from pure mass one? Like, even one suggestion can make your day. Yeah, like you can save a lot of time. Nudge you in the right direction. Yeah. Put you back in the right direction. Yeah, yeah I see. So at, at, at what point did you realize you didn't need a mentor anymore? Because you said that 
at this point, you are pretty much self-taught. You're pretty much self-made. So when you realize that you can, you know, sort of let go of your mentors and go solo. And I was asking questions mm -hmm. and a lot of people around me got in. Mm -hmm. Like my closest friend for Davs, uh, when we were talking, he got into Cornell in early decision, mm -hmm. in early cycle, mm -hmm. in the first year. Mm -hmm. And some other friends got in. We had the same knowledge. He didn't have a mentor. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a mentor. We prepared mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And then he got in. I didn't. Mm -hmm. Completely fine. I just thought if they could do it, I could do it too. Mm -hmm. And I could do it. It's just, you know, it goes back to luck. Admissions mm -hmm. game is not as you sing it. It's not, if you're qualified, you'll get in. That, it doesn't work like that. It's like mm -hmm. a lottery. Even if you're qualified, there are so many people smarter than you with higher SAT scores who want more, better, more competitive Olympiads. You don't know. And even the people who got in, I think there's a significant aspect of luck in mm -hmm. their success. And mm -hmm. the same goes in my success, in my acceptance to Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Mm -hmm. I was lucky, and everyone is. It's not like people get in because they really deserve it. So, and what was your experience of applying to a Hong Kong University of Technology and Science, right? Uh, science and Technology. Science and Technology. So, uh, can you walk us through your experience of uh, preparing your application? for universities? Yeah. Uh, so let's, let's start from scratch. The general application, mm -hmm. uh, so let's start from scratch. Mm -hmm. I got into an academic lyceum of diplomacy, let's mm -hmm. say, in, the, in Tashkent. I had a few peers there who were planning to apply, but at some other schools, at Westminster and Interhouse Lyceum, I had some other friends who were applying who were really good. They were good as me or even better. Mm -hmm. And then we were preparing to get, we had communities on Telegram. And when, when I went to the SAT course by Abdulaziz Sharapov, uh, uh, like I knew almost everyone who was applying. And everyone who was applying knew me. Mm -hmm. So we could talk. Whenever a question arises, I would write to them or mm -hmm. to Abdulaziz Sharapov or to some other people. And they would ask from me because you know, I was doing mm -hmm. a lot of research. And I almost knew. I basically memorized all of the acceptance rates of all universities that mm -hmm. give scholarships mm -hmm. and some other things as well. So you start out joining a community of like-minded people yeah. yeah, who are on the same mission, who are trying to get yes. into top yes. universities. Same so goals. you need to be in that environment, Yes, right? You need to feel those vibes. You need to know what's what, what's trending, right? Yeah. yeah. Whatever event we go, uh -huh. we might go to TEDx, we might go to MUN, mm -hmm. all we discuss is admissions. Mm -hmm. Like for example, businessman, if you look at some billionaires, mm -hmm. Do you think Mark Zuckerberg, when he meets Jeff Bezos, talks about girls or football? No. <laughs> he talks about business or money. Yeah. Right? And the same goes with people in the admissions. If they, if they succeeded, mm -hmm. it's probably because they breathed and lived and slept on admissions. They yeah. talk about admissions all the time, and that's what we did all the time. So you have to have that maniacal obsession yeah, with, that, with admissions. Yes. Right. It's very hard. Yeah. And then what happened next? What happened next was I got into some universities with mm -hmm. up to full tuition scholarship. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to name them, mm -hmm. so I did not brag. I didn't go because I thought I could get into a better school the next year if I take mm -hmm. a year. So even uh, what, what's the most amount of scholarship you were offered? Oh, 55 multiplied by 4, 220. You turned down 220 hundred thousand dollar scholarship yes and and i want to wow. make this clear it's not about <laughs> the amount of money that you get it's how much what proportion of the entire cost of attendance it covers mm -hmm. if, if it costs eighty thousand dollars if it covers fifty thousand dollars and you have to pay 30k oh, yeah. a year uh -huh. and you brag about it mm -hmm. you're probably misleading people yeah i don't like misleading people yeah, i want to yeah. be as honest and, and transparent yeah. as possible i was happy uh -huh. but I thought I could do more, and mm -hmm. it was nothing to be so, happy about. Uh, there's no point winning $200,000 scholarship if you have another $120,000 to pay. <laughs> it's okay yeah. to talk if you're going, uh -huh. if you can afford yeah. completely. You did what you were supposed to do mm -hmm. fantastically. You succeeded. I, my purpose was I apply, I mm -hmm. get in with full scholarship. Yeah, and that's what most students want. They want a full ride scholarship. Yes. Right. Yeah, Is a full right. ride or full tuition, yeah. Yeah. And I didn't achieve my purpose, and I was mm. fine with it. And that's when actually the mentor comes into play. Mm -hmm. Our teacher, Abdul Sharapas, would say, 
because he took a gap year, he would say, mm -hmm. taking a gap year is fine. You can take your, mm -hmm. a lot, in fact, a lot of people who go to top schools take a gap year. You can discover yourself. Mm -hmm. And you can, you will have better chances because it's the second time you're applying, right? Mm -hmm. you, have, you know what mistakes you've made. You know what procrastination leads to, mm -hmm. inefficiency, slowness, mm -hmm. everything. And then I decided to take a gap year. And plus I started my school one year earlier than my peers. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was thinking like, it's, it's fine. Mm -hmm. And my parents were also okay because I was, I was keeping, I kept telling them, hey, there's a very high chance I will not get in. Like, I tried my best. I was not sleeping. You, you, you saw what happened. I was living in the library. Most likely it's not going to work out. And you ha it's not like, you, you have to tell your parents before the results are out. So they are okay with it. Mm -hmm. Because once, they, once you get the rejection, mm -hmm. parents will have the impression that others, other people's kids are getting in mm -hmm. to Narcos or some other university and your kid didn't get in even though he had IELTS 8, high SAT, mm -hmm. good English and everything. Mm -hmm. And my uh, teacher, Abdullah Sharap, would tell us, uh, most likely you'll not get in, be okay with it. And if you can take a gap here, it's completely fine. And from there grew mm -hmm. our view on gap years. Mm -hmm. So is it a good thing taking a gap year? How do you feel about taking a gap year? I feel like unless you're exceptional, mm -hmm. which most people are not, because mm -hmm. exception is an exception, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's better to take a gap year than mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. Let me explain. First of all, you get to discover or make yourself. It's easy to wake up when you have to go to a lesson, to study, to work. But in your gap year, your parents generally don't tell you what to do because if you had the courage to take a gap year, they believe in you, they trust in you. So mm -hmm. you are in control of yourself. You can wake up, you can start reading the passage, Nietzsche or whatever the person is, you can mm -hmm. start uh, working on your SAT. Mm -hmm. So you get to discover yourself. Are you a disciplined person? Mm -hmm. If not, can you make yourself disciplined? Mm -hmm. Can you make yourself focus on a passage for, mm -hmm. uh, for one hour? Mm -hmm. Can you force yourself? If not, can you do some other stuff? Like, If you're reading philosophy, you don't have to force yourself. You can get something that is interesting to you. And that's what's good about a gap year. When you're at university or school, if you pick a subject, mm -hmm. you most likely have to finish it. Mm -hmm. Even if you find it incredibly boring and useless. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people find literature, fiction, right? Mm -hmm. But with the gap year, you can change things. Mm -hmm. I said from economics, I tried uh, f financial technologies, I, I tried philosophy. Mm -hmm. I discovered philosophy in my gap year. I didn't really like mm -hmm. it. Uh, when I first started out, I thought it was useless. Like, why question God, mm -hmm. right? But then when I started reading, I started separating. I, it started making me more mature, more understandable of humans. But here's what I think. I'm <clears throat> I think unless you have self-discipline and the right mindset, a gap year might be a waste. It might, might as well be a waste of your life, a waste of your time. Because to do all those things you're talking about, you have to have self-control. You have to have the discipline to set your alarm to 7, 8 o'clock in the morning and wake up and follow through with your daily routine. Follow through with your study plan, which most students lack, right? But at the same time, I com I'm completely supportive of a gap year. Because here's why. I realized I discovered them myself and learned a lot about the world after I graduated university then in all the years of my university, yeah, right? When I ha finally had that time off the grid, when I went off the grid, yeah. I was not part of the grid anymore, right? When I went off the matrix, I could see the world for myself, through, explore it through my own lenses. And I was glad to have the self-control and discipline to consistently do, do it. But with the majority of people, with the majority of students, they simply don't have these simple basic foundations, fundamentals. They don't simply have the, the, the self-control and the self-growth mindset yeah. to bring themselves to pick up a book or look up some article online and read it or listen to a podcast like this one. Um, I would say 
you don't need a discipline. You don't need oh, focus. Really? You don't need anything. Join the community. Join mm. our community. See me getting IELTS 8. Mm. See your other friend getting IELTS 7.5, getting mm. high SAT, mm -hmm. winning in a competition, winning in a hackathon. Mm. You're doing stuff that you're not doing. You're slipping. You'll mm. be pissed off. Yeah, you, you would. You would. That, will insp that will be a sufficient motivation because you already took a gap here and uh -huh. you, you have to make it happen. You have to pull it off. Mm -hmm. And that, a lot of the times gives you the discipline. At the worst case, mm -hmm. what you're going to do is, if you're not doing anything, mm -hmm. you'll at least get a job because you mm -hmm. speak English, right? Mm -hmm. And when people go to uh, work, mm -hmm. I mean, you understand, right? Mm -hmm. That it gets to see how people are. Mm -hmm. I, I spoke English, but I didn't work mm -hmm. in a real work environment. Mm -hmm. I started working as the manager of a creative director in one leading fashion brand. Mm -hmm. And I got to see how people really work how people interact with each other. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, what you discover is you may be an intellectual, you may be fascinated by science, by physics, philosophy, but you, what you find out is people are struggling. People are barely making ads and meet. They're not making a lot of money, even though they are smart. And what you understand is not only do you have to pick a subject that you're good at and are passionate about, but you also have to find a subject that overlaps with what the society is willing to pay for. Mm -hmm. I was passionate about economics. I still love reading economics, supply and demand, market dynamics, mm -hmm. Milton Friedman, Marx. I love it with all of my heart. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't make money. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be smart telling politicians, hey, you should do this, you should do this, otherwise we'll have this problem. Mm -hmm. But then being broke. <laughs> like, yeah. you, you can... Direct your knowledge to things where it makes money, but uh -huh. you also have to, but you also get to enjoy it, right? Yeah, right. Like Naval once said, you don't want to be uh, famous and broke. Like yes. a lot of people are. Yes, there completely. Are, uh, influencers on social media, but their bank account shows practically zero. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, and that's literally me at this point. A lot of people think that I make a ton teaching and having this podcast, but they have no idea, right? I'm I'm, I'm barely getting by. In life. Yeah. <laughs> now, well, no, no, not exactly. I don't want to say that. I, I mean, I make enough to put food on the table, roof over our house, pay pay the bills and stuff, right? Yeah, right. But unlike contrary to most, what most people think. I'm, I'm not driving those fancy car cars. Yeah. I'm not going to fancy parties every night, right? Or having fun. That's what people think. I have to come to work every day just like everyone else, right? Yeah. Right. So I, I got my schedule planned out. I have to go and sit meetings. I got a lot of responsibilities. So I can make a good enough li living to pay the bills and have food and, you know, have clothes and shelter over, shelter to, you know, all these basic necessities. And it's so, so important that people understand this, that money mm. should be considered. It should not be the priority, the mm -hmm. highest priority, but it must be considered when choosing a mm -hmm. major. Mm -hmm. And at least even if that realization comes to the mind, mm -hmm. that will already be perhaps enough mm -hmm. to make a person learn things that are useful at college. Right. I really like the way you put, put it when you said what you're passionate about, if you want to be rich, what you're passionate about what you want to excel in has to overlap what society needs. Yes. That, that's great phrasing, great putting. But I want to make a little addition here. So <clears throat> aside from picking a subject you're really interested in and something society wants, desires, needs, you have to be also excellent at marketing it. You have to be excellent at advertising it. And that's one of the examples I'm always telling our staff here, teachers. Okay, you might be the best teacher in the world, but if you don't know how to advertise your skills and if nobody knows who you, who you are, those skills are nothing. Yep. And the example I usually give them is Gordon Ramsay. Everyone thinks Gordon Ramsay the best chef in the world. Is he not? But there are... So many people out there who cook 10 times better than Gordon Ramsay, but nobody, nobody knows their existence because they yeah. don't know how to market their skills. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, marketing, that's where marketing comes in, right? So one thing about that, I have a lot of friends who read real advanced stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I read philosophy. Mm -hmm. That's the easiest, easiest thing in my mm -hmm. little community. Uh, for example, my friend Ferdows, 
He does computer science and math mm -hmm. at Cornell University. Wow. He reads really hard stuff. Can I ever have him on the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell him. Uh, please, yeah. Ever, if you, Mr. Ferdas, if you ever come back to Uzbekistan on your summer He's vacation. He's in Uzbekistan. He is. He was bored, actually. Uh -huh. all, right, all right, listen. I, I got time next week or the week after that. Saturday. Let's do Saturday, okay? Because I might be booked on Sunday, so I let's do Saturday. I'll tell him, yeah. Yeah, so he reads math and computer science. That uh -huh. is hard. Like math alone, uh -huh. that should be enough for people to understand how hard that is. Mm -hmm. And there are some other people who read very hard books, right? Mm -hmm. And when you read those kinds of books, and then you pick up, what? Rich that Poor that. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Self, just, that's a self-development book. That's a yeah, self-help book, yeah. and they just... What bullshit mm -hmm. is he talking about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After reading, for example, I don't know, Paul Graham's mm -hmm. Intelligent Investor. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the least part, right? Mm -hmm. So, they have this sense that those books are purely written to sell. Mm -hmm. this, the same goes with Robert Greene's books mm -hmm. and other books. They have this bias that they are mm -hmm. useless. And they have some premises, right? For example, when I read a self-help book, what normally happens is the entire book has one message. Mm -hmm. Like, man, you, you should not have taken one book to write it. You could have, write, you could have written an article mm -hmm. on Medium or some New York Times. Yeah. And that's what's interesting about Nietzsche. He said, my goal in writing is to put what it takes a lot of writers to write one book for me to take one paragraph or one page. Mm -hmm. or even one sentence. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what it was, but it was something like this. Mm -hmm. Very concise, dense. Mm -hmm. You can learn a lot about the world. Mm -hmm. But you read that and then you turn to self-help books because self-help books, let's acknowledge, they are mostly written for a general audience, not for us and not for you. Mm -hmm. They have this bias. And recently, so I have a study group. We wake up in the morning and read some books. We started from the least difficult book. It was Bronson's Expert Secrets. He wrote dot-com secrets and expert secrets. He basically teaches people how to get traffic mm -hmm. to the audience. For example, if, you have, if people are watching your podcast, you can learn how to turn that uh, viewership into conversion. You can convert them to sales. Mm -hmm. He teaches that. And we were learning that in you know, a basic brand differentiation, like those kinds of stuff. And our group, I ask, what's your first impression? And they say, I'm skeptical. That's like basic stuff. People know this. Completely useless. Uh, that's cringy. Mm -hmm. That kind of stuff. And what I mean by this is people have to lower the bias. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have bias. For example, you might have some bias toward reading philosophy books. Mm -hmm. People have, may have different biases. But you, you have to be open-minded. And what mm -hmm. happens with a lot of smart people is they have bias to reading. They're essential, they're basic, they're easy to understand and make, make, make sense, just easy. But they don't do it. And mm -hmm. that's why they end up not being as successful as they could be. So mm -hmm. marketing is also very important completely. Yeah, it is. It really is. Yeah, we did quite a lot talking about reading and SAT, right? Yeah. You want to... I mean, at this point, I don't want to ask you any IELTS questions. <laughs> I really don't, unless you want to talk about it. Yeah, I can say one thing. Yeah. I you can put it in one, one sentence. You can't put IELTS in one sentence at this point. <laughs> yeah, if, if, because, because if, this conversation is dense. It's a lot to take in. Yeah. For, every, for an average viewer, that's not an easy conversation. If right? you read a lot, uh -huh. Your IELTS will be fine. Don't. Pre I didn't prepare for one day. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be honest. With you. I did one mock test. Mm -hmm. I got seven in it. Mm -hmm. Like I'm. I'm not sure why, mm -hmm. but I didn't prepare almost at all. Mm -hmm. I got eight this time. Last time I got seven point five overall mm -hmm. and in writing mm -hmm. without zero prep, without any preparation. Mm -hmm. And that's enough for you mm -hmm. to get into a college. Seven point five mm -hmm. and eight is enough. And if you read a lot, you will have that score. You don't need 8.5. You, you can have it, and it's, mm -hmm. going, it's certainly going to be a plus for you because you can work, you can you know, mm -hmm. basically brag, to people, brag off to people. But if you want to get into a mm -hmm. top university, mm -hmm. don't spend too much time. If you read books, mm -hmm. if you 
start questioning, you will be fine with IELTS. Yeah, and, and plus at this point, guys, IELTS is not a flex. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's not a flex. Even if you have 10 bad nines, no one cares. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So just get over it, guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Enough with that IELTS obsession, because a lot of kids are, a lot of kids are. And this is one of the reasons why I want to have more people involved in SAT uni admission on the podcast, because I, I want these people to come in, pick, lift their head up and show them the bigger picture. Yeah. Hey, you're, this is so, you're missing so much, right? Because you're it, it over investing too much of your time and your resources, your money to chase something that doesn't is not really worth much in the real world. Yeah. In the real world. Some of the greatest yes. people to ever exist on our universe have written books. Mm-hmm. They have books written about them. Marcus Aurelius mm-hmm. has written Meditations. Mm-hmm. Nietzsche has written Beyond Good and Evil. Mm-hmm. Aristotle wrote different books, rhetoric, politics, wow. and others. Can I, can I pause you for a second? When you named the title of the Nietzsche's book, I just got little goosebumps. <laughs> I literally got goosebumps. Beyond Good and Evil. I instantly remember that moment in paradise when a- Adam and Eve take a bite out of that uh. apple of good and evil. Right? And he's so challenging you to think beyond that. My God. I have to give that, give that one a read. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to add that one to my read That's list. That's a fantastic journey. You've read that book? I did, yeah. You did? So, <clears throat> all right, so, c- carry on with your list. Sorry. So there's Beyond yeah. Good and Evil of Nietzsche. Mm-hmm. There's War and Peace mm-hmm. of Tolstoy. That seems like cliche, mm-hmm. but if you actually read it and question, you can understand how society, uh, mm-hmm. how the French Revolution mm-hmm. impacted the Russian society. And you mm-hmm. can learn how yourself you can impact your society. Mm-hmm. If you want to impact your society, the easiest, the best, the most effective way is to read the books where it clearly shows how it happened. And you can um, identify the trends, the patterns, and then incorporate them to your own masses, right? Mm-hmm. So the best, the, not the best, the greatest, the worst people have written books. It can be Hitler, it can be Marcus Aurelius, it can mm-hmm. be uh, Timerlein. Mm-hmm. can be Goethe or writers. Mm-hmm. Every great person, every worst person you can name has written some books. And there is a reason. Why? Because writing is thinking. If you can write, you can think. Don't confuse speaking with thinking. When, when you are asked what's your favorite color or why do you want to go to university, what you're saying is what you hear from the internet. The real response is going to be when you write it down. And why is that? What does writing have, what something writing has, speaking doesn't? So what, it is clear that writing is thinking. Mm-hmm. A lot of people, the greatest people, everyone writes. We can infer from that. Mm-hmm. And when you write, you get to write authentically, right? You get to write your own ideas, whatever comes to your mind. Mm -hmm. So the thing with writing is what people confuse is they write the first sentence, Mm -hmm. they erase it and write it differently. Mm -hmm. Writing doesn't work like that. Writing is thinking and your thoughts are not structured. Mm -hmm. You can write whatever that comes to your mind Mm -hmm. in the first draft and then you get to polish it, you get to edit it. Mm -hmm. And that's what the most important part is. You write all of your thoughts down and then you eliminate the ones that doesn't make sense, mm-hmm. that are not true. Yeah. So you can polish your thoughts on, in the time that you're writing. So like when you're writing, you take the time to observe your thoughts, yes. to sit and observe your thoughts, and then take that incoherent mess and turn it into a meaningful yeah. work. Yeah, right. and the secret to writing well is thinking well, right? Mm -hmm. If your writing is clear, it's polished, if you can communicate your ideas in the Mm -hmm. written format Mm -hmm. to a paper very well, Mm -hmm. you can think well. Mm -hmm. And it's no wonder why the greatest people to ever live in our universe have written. Mm -hmm. They wrote a lot. Mm -hmm. So, and which, which, how do you get, how do you get good thoughts and how do you get into that gear? You ever, like sometimes you have trouble 
ordering your thoughts, marshalling your thoughts, yeah. right? Or sometimes just it's not there. You're trying, it's not there. It just doesn't want to come out. That's the point. Yeah. It doesn't come out when you speak. Mm-hmm. I don't understand why people say they think mm-hmm. when they can't even write it. If they can't write it, they mm-hmm. can't say it. Mm-hmm. When people write, you can write whatever you want, no. whatever comes to your mind, and only after finishing the draft and then you start uh, polishing it. No, what, what I meant to ask was like, how do you produce good thoughts? How do you make sure you consistently produce? Because you said to be a good writer, you have to be a good thinker. Yeah. So how do you become a good thinker? Is uh, again, that some... What I'm saying is, mm-hmm. you can write all the thoughts that come to your mm-hmm. mind. You just have to write, mm-hmm. and then you eliminate the ones that doesn't make that don't make sense. Oh yeah. So it's, you write everything. Mm-hmm. For example, Tolstoy mm-hmm. wrote very badly in his mm-hmm. first drafts. Mm-hmm. And the same goes with practically every writer. Mm-hmm. There is not a single writer who could produce a brilliant piece. Mm-hmm. You can take any book, you can read the history, and it's going to be such that it was at least, at the very least, the second draft. But I bet mm-hmm. every great book has a, had at least 10 iterations. Mm-hmm. So yeah. people write and then they don't analyze. Mm-hmm. If it's, for example, IELTS 8 or 9, if it's IELTS 9, then I don't, it's perfect. Mm-hmm. No, there's always a room for improvement. You can always make your thoughts more sharp. Mm-hmm. You can make them clear and mm-hmm. more effective. And right. then once they are effective, clear and sharp, what you need to do is work on rhetoric. Mm-hmm. You should also be able to convince the reader that what you're saying is true. Mm-hmm. Which is one of the, I think, prerequisites in IELTS writing as well. When I'm teaching students how to write essays, I don't really talk about how to boost their coherence or how to boost their uh, task response or vocabulary or grammar, not say these things not important. What I teach them instead that right off the bat, number one thing is how to develop an effective argument. And what is an effective argument? So I I break down the concept of an effective argument. And I usually do it with the example of Ronaldo versus Messi. So I ask these students this question. Hey, guys, you're into soccer? And they say, everyone, yeah, we are. We watched the soccer match last night. It was amazing. Uh, Spain won. Spain won (laughs) the Euro Cup, right? Uh, English or Spanish? Yeah. I'm not not actually interested in soccer. Anyway. And I asked them, so who's your favorite soccer player? And so I says... Or of who's, who's, who do you think is the best soccer player in the world? And some say it's Ronaldo, some say it's Messi. And I say, hey, you, back it up. Back it up. Okay, I'm a Ronaldo fan. You're saying Messi is the best. You have to prove me wrong. All right. And then they say he has good dribbling skills and he's an amazing soccer player. He's talented and he's all that. Okay, I say, well, I'm not convinced because you could say all these things about Ronaldo too. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But then another guy comes and says, Messi has eight Ballon d'Ors. Is it eight? Sorry, guys. How many, how many Ballon d'Ors? Please correct me here. Eight, eight Ballon d'Ors. And Ronaldo has only five. Well, that's a good, now that's a good, good backup. That's, that's good evidence. And then they say, Messi has won the World Cup. Ronaldo hasn't, right? And Messi has X number of golden boots. And Ronaldo has fewer. So clearly... Messi has more on his record than Ronaldo. See, he must be the best soccer player in the world. Now, that's what you call an effective argumentation. That's again, yeah. for IELTS, it yeah. can be interpreted as a valid convincing argument. Mm-hmm. But in general, mm-hmm. you can't convince a person that Messi is better than Ronaldo just because he has more Ballon d'Ors. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you go into the world and say, mm-hmm. for example, if you tell me Messi is mm-hmm. better because he has more Ballon d'Ors, I can say, why would you measure from mm-hmm. the bell and doors? Mm-hmm. Why don't you look at the goals? Mm-hmm. Why don't you look at who Ronaldo had as a team? But I think uh, Messi has. You can always question. Messi, right? has, Messi has scored more goals than Ronaldo, right? Is, Perhaps is that, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is, not soccer and it's not here. just having having a premise, right? Uh-huh. So that's uh, the supporting argu- The mm-hmm. supporting proposition is a premise. Mm-hmm. Premise having a premise. And an argument and an idea that mm-hmm. has something that is that it's pushing forward, it's just the beginning, right? You have the argument, you have the proposition that has an idea, and then you have the premise, a supporting clause. That's the beginning. The most important part here is to connect them. Mm-hmm. And that's what you learn in SAT. Mm-hmm. The easiest way, uh, the best way perhaps is to 
do SAT. Like that mm-hmm. was what happened to me. And you get to connect. He has ball on doors. Mm-hmm. It's easy to say which means he's a better. Mm-hmm. But you could connect it through other devices. So how would you advance that argument? How would you take that argument and advance it in SAT terms? And please speak to the mic. Because right? every time this guy is talking, my heart is, is the mic picking up? Is the mic picking up? <laughs> yeah. yeah. The mic. Well, the mic. The mic. <laughs> how about we talk about something other than football? I don't want to make football mainstream. Let's not uh-huh. talk about football. Let's talk about something more serious. Sure. You choose. You pick a topic. And we develop an argument. First, I'm going to develop an IELTS terms, and you're going to take it a step further. Okay, you can ask a question. I'll develop it. Well, I don't know. You pick a topic. You said not interested in soccer. Okay. And, and, and that's the thing. I think one of the qualities of a good writer is a, a good writer should be able to talk about anything, literally anything, even yeah. if they're not interested in soccer. Yeah. I mean, so, I could. Yeah. I just don't want to bring that example up because... Sure, sure. Don't be obsessed with football, no, 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 with please, please. politics. Go. Okay, let's, uh-huh. let's talk mm-hmm. about Uzbekistan joining World Trade Organization. Mm-hmm. Sure. So World Trade Organization is an organization that puts traf- uh, traffics or Ta- the tariffs. tax rates and uh-huh. different kinds of stuff, right? Uh-huh. And Uzbekistan is putting some efforts to joining WTO. Mm-hmm. And I might argue that Uzbekistan should not join WTO. Mm-hmm. That's a proposition. That's the highest proposition. It has an idea that it's pushing forward. It's pushing against Uzbekistan joining WTO. Okay. So it's the proposition one, right? Uh-huh. And then I have the premise. That is, why? Because Uzbekistan is not, Uzbekistan's businesses are not as developed mm-hmm. as to join the competition with the world. Mm-hmm. We are not able to compete with Amazon, mm-hmm. with large corporations that can basically not even profit mm-hmm. just to get the market share. Mm-hmm. So I defend the small businesses. Okay. And that's going to be the premise. And then you need to connect it. Mm-hmm. So how do you do that? If we want Uzbekistan's population Mm -hmm. We want the society to prosper. Mm -hmm. We want the people to be happy Mm -hmm. about living here. We need to prioritize local population. Mm -hmm. And in order to prioritize local population, we need to take more time before we join WTO. Mm -hmm. So it's not just connecting. It's saying it's connecting it through something rhetorical, Mm -hmm. something that would also touch the character, Mm -hmm. emotions, Mm -hmm. and also should be logical. Right. And... Because there is emotion part, I think you, you could counter that argument, counter that point, saying that it's better to join, it's, it's, it's a good thing to join WTO mm-hmm. because then you'd have those multinational companies come in and set up shop in Uzbekistan and create a lot of vacancies for common men, right? And bring, There's a lot. bring their intellect, bring their knowledge, bring their technology, bring their business practices yeah. and help the country get off its feet. And then you may mm-hmm. be quirky. Quirky is mm-hmm. being unexpected about your arguments. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of construction going on in Tashkent. Mm-hmm. But people working in the construction, the regular people, are barely making enough to sustain their lives and mm-hmm. the lives of their family. Mm-hmm. Even though the real estate costs are expensive. Mm -hmm. A normal average person will not be able to afford in any way. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the people in top, people starting this construction Mm -hmm. and building it all, the investors are taking all the money, most of the money. Mm -hmm. They're not giving it, they're not distributing the wealth Mm -hmm. um, justly. Mm -hmm. Which means if large corporations come Mm-hmm. People will be working for minimum wage. Mm-hmm. You can raise the minimum wage, but it's going to, but it's only going to have an impact on the local population. But, but because the prices will go up. Yeah. But uh, but anyway, that's it's it's better than not having jobs. It's better than being unemployed. If because because our, lo- our population is growing fast now, and there might not simply be enough vacancies in the market because. Uh, we're not always 
genius enough, creative enough to create new jobs, right? Like to create new prospects in the market. So we need a little bit of that. We need to outsource that. Basically, that's what I'm trying to say. Yes. You need to bring that intellect, ingenuity, and creativity here to this country. And when that comes, mm -hmm. there is a chance that once the population has mm -hmm. developed, mm -hmm. it may not be competitive enough mm -hmm. to sustain the competition. Yeah. It's hard to compete with Google. Mm -hmm. Very hard. Mm -hmm. And if the population, at least education, mm -hmm. grows up, if the education is strong, mm -hmm. that people can think and be resilient enough and have enough belief that they can make it if they start a business, mm -hmm. if they do the marketing. For example, now, I believe that if you do the marketing right, you can sell anything mm -hmm. in Uzbekistan, especially in Tashkent. Mm -hmm. I see so many advertisements, so many, how do you call it, targets mm -hmm. on Instagram. Mm -hmm. ads. Every sort of story is an, an ad. That was not the case three or four years ago. I went to Dubai and that was the case. So we are close to Dubai in terms of the ads. If there are more ads, it means there are businesses that are making ma money. Mm -hmm. It means that businesses are seeing value in advertisement. Mm -hmm. If there is advertisement, if they are seeing value in it, then mm -hmm. it means they're selling. Yeah. So there is some growth. It's possible. It, it's just that the government or other people have to encourage people to start their own ventures, mm -hmm. to risk it all, and they can make it happen. But if they don't and allow w, uh, WTO to come in, even if the local population wants it, it will not be able to sustain the competition. The only way will be is a corporate ladder, which is very hard because it will also it will be competitive. Mm -hmm. It's way easier to start your own business and make more money. You can make more money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, sure. There, there are always trade-offs. Trade-offs. Yeah. There are always trade-offs. And it's not it's about just, being right or wrong. It's mm -hmm. just being able to find ways mm -hmm. to at least convince the other person that there are some flaws in the argument. I'm convinced. <laughs> I'm sold. Uh, uh, partly because I'm biased. Because I'm a, I'm a small business. business. Yeah, I'm a small business owner. And if uh, any international prep school moved in here, would be out of business, would be jobless, yeah. would be out in the streets. And I know that, I understand the, that. The maximum well. that the regular yeah. person will be able to do is mm -hmm. just get a job there. Mm -hmm. But again, it's, it's not going to be well paying because mm -hmm. they want to make money. They want to wash mm -hmm. all the money. Yeah, uh, they just cut costs, pay you minimum wage, yeah. right? And, and take all the profit home. Yeah. Right? That's what they would want. All right, we did a lot of talking about uh, everything. Because we went, we went from philosophy to uh, business, marketing, a little bit of everything. Now, what do you say we talk a little about some extracurriculars you're involved in? I, I know you're into sports. You're a sports guy. So would you like to tell us a little about your mar marathon adventures? I know you run a lot of marathons. Yeah. So, oh, and you said you, you've been running marathons since you were in sixth grade, right? Or much younger? I have been running, ever since I started walking, mm. I was running. Yeah. I don't remember any time where I, when I was not running. Uh -huh. But initially I was running, you know, sprints. I would run five kilometers mm -hmm. just for, you know, warm up. Five kilometers is your warm up? <laughs> I mean, it's normal. We would... Are you kidding? For average people like me, okay, if I run one kilometer... I'm out. You need an ambulance <laughs> to take me out. <laughs> uh, you need, you need, I need, I'm going to need an ambulance. I'm going to need, you're going to come literally drag me in an ambulance car, take me to a hospital and do some CPR. All right. <laughs> <laughs> One kilometer, I'm out. Right. I, but this but, guy says he runs five kilometers for warm up. When Get you, out of here. <laughs> when, when you do it consistently yeah. and you don't expect much from yourself, uh -huh. you can handle it. Like, mm -hmm. You don't have to run very fast. You can run slowly, mm -hmm. you can stop at times, it's okay to stop, mm -hmm. but you should not give it up. Mm -hmm. And because I was, I've been running so consistently for mm -hmm. fifth, not 15, but around 13 years at this point, mm -hmm. uh, I can run a lot. So regarding my marathon journey, I have always been interested in running and some large events were happening in Fergan back when I was in Fergan and my father would say, there's a marathon, would you like to run? I would say, Okay, let's do it. But it was like two or three kilometers. Not fun. 
It's just it's just because you're mm. running with other people that is fun. That makes it fun. Two in or the city. three kilometers is not a marathon, though. It's a sprint. <laughs> Yeah, it's a sprint, <laughs> it's basically. A sprint. It's not a marathon. And you don't win it because there are some profession professionals, right? Yeah. And then when I came to Tashkent, I saw that there, mm. were, there are large marathon running communities. They run every day or mm -hmm. three times a week. Mm -hmm. uh, they practice, and then they go to marathons. For example, they can go to Zamin, they can go to different types of marathons and run there. Mm -hmm. And in my 11th grade, I saw a marathon happening in Zamin, which is... Mm -hmm. uh, village or city in Jizak. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to go there, but I found it was it would be expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, I did some fast calculations, figured out it was mm -hmm. not affordable. Mm -hmm. And then I told my friends, hey, there's a marathon happening over there. Would you like to go? And then they said no. And then obviously I found a way to convince them that mm -hmm. how marathon would be a fantastic experience. Hey, you're going to college. Mm -hmm. Why do you want to study? Mm -hmm. Take some rest, go to mountains, explore, travel Uzbekistan. You want to travel the world, but you, you want to travel the world before traveling Uzbekistan? You know, some arguments. Convince them. Mm -hmm. We went to Zamin. It was fantastic. It was a fantastic experience. Everyone loved it. We had, you know, travels and challenges. The most interesting part about marathon trips is not running itself. Running sucks. It's not easy, mm -hmm. especially in Zamin. You are going up. Mm -hmm. Big, big, big incline. Yes, yeah. you're going up. It's, it's like not fun. Carrying weight on your back. That's how it yeah. feels. And it's really hard on your knees. It's yes. really hard on your knees. Uh, on everything. Legs, yeah. mm -hmm. mind. But mm -hmm. it's more of a mind game. You know, yeah. what was the name of the David Goggins? Are you kidding Go me? <laughs> you don't know me, son. <laughs> Who's going to carry, carry the, the boats? boats? Yeah, and the logs. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's a I hope you're suffering right now. I hope you're not in your couch out there suffering in this hot weather. I hope I hope you're sweating. I hope you're going through hell. A little bit of yeah, And you do go here. through <laughs> you do go through hell. Yeah. And basically it's a mental exercise. No <clears throat> one is watching you. You can mm -hmm. always turn your back and mm -hmm. come back. Mm -hmm. But would you allow yourself? Would you mm -hmm. allow yourself to stop? Or you're going to keep continue. You may walk, mm -hmm. but you cannot give mm -hmm. up. You cannot come back. And are you going to be able to live with yourself yes. for doing that? Yeah. And that's the question I had in my mind. The moment you said run a marathon, I thought, can I, am I ever going to be able to run a marathon? If I do, what if I come to a point where I feel like quitting and I do? Am I, am I going to be able to live with that loss on my record? Yeah. I honestly can't because I'm a pretty competitive guy too. Yeah. I'm, I'm very competitive. I don't openly talk about it, but I am ruthless. I'd rather die in that spot, right, and, and let my body rot there yeah. and never get buried than, than, than tap out, throw in the towel. That's unacceptable, right? Yeah. So, it, and when you have that sort of mentality, that's, that's just... <laughs> you're, and, you, uh, the best part is it's not just the marathon. It translates mm -hmm. to other ventures. If uh -huh. you have a business... And you're not making any profit. It's been a year. Mm -hmm. Empo employee, employee, mm -hmm. Employees are not happy. Mm -hmm. uh, your customers are not happy. You, have, you don't have any growth. Mm -hmm. If you do not give up, perhaps you will be able to pull it off. Mm -hmm. So it also translates to other ventures mm -hmm. and activities. And what's the longest you've ever run? I ran a full marathon, 42 kilometers, 195 meters in Kazakhstan. You said four, four, 42. 42 kilometers. Yeah. That's, that's impressive. In Kazakhstan, right? Yeah, it was in Kazakhstan. So how did it feel? What was that experience like? I almost broke my neck in 20 kilometers. Uh -huh. I've been running well for like 20, 22 kilometers while I was preparing. So I took like one month to prepare only. Before that, I, mm -hmm. I was you know, having my studies. It took one month to prepare. I thought, as long as I do not give up, I should be fine. Mm -hmm. But then when I started running, that was unexpected. You know, mm -hmm. It was really hard. I ran a lot, but that experience, I almost broke my neck. And then I was drinking so much. Mm -hmm. Turns out it's very important that you have nutrition in mm -hmm. order. Mm -hmm. My nutrition was fine, but because I was running mm -hmm. for hours, it was not enough. I drank five liters of water, mm -hmm. ate seven bananas, mm -hmm. ate ten sneakers. Mm -hmm. There were some other things I was eating mm -hmm. uh, in four hours, and I didn't go to bathroom or anywhere else. Mm -hmm. I, I was just running. 
Five liters of water. Can you imagine that? And where do you carry all that stuff? With you or there are people on roads? No, there, there are people. There are people. Yeah. There are places where you and can get And there are like them. checkpoints. When you reach them, you can yes, sit they and can chill. Check. Yeah. And then, you know, rest for five minutes and then carry on, right? You can, you mm-hmm. can do whatever you want. Mm-hmm. As long as you do not turn your back and come back, mm-hmm. you can sleep or mm-hmm. do whatever you want. There is obviously a time limit, like mm-hmm. six hours. Mm-hmm. I finished in four hours and half an hour. Mm-hmm. You're, he ran 42 kilometer marathon in four hours. That's yes. 10 kilometers every hour, right? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that, that, Ten minutes. That's 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 impressive. I don't. I honestly don't know what to say, guys. He's nineteen. And he's running marathons out there, conquering the I world. I ran it when what I was. What am I doing I here? I ran it when I was sixteen. Uh huh. Uh, you ran that when you were sixteen. Yes. My mind doesn't compute right now. That, that's how do you do that? I'm so late to this game. Okay, I gotta get it. I gotta it's get. It's never get, late. Most of the people who start running marathons mm-hmm. started very late. Mm-hmm. Like. After 35, mm-hmm. that's what usually happens. And how old are you? I'm, uh, I'm 670 years old. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> and in English? <laughs> and and, and uh, yeah, in English, 25. I'm I'm turning 25. You're young. Soon. Yes, I'm <laughs> you turning can, 25. You can soon. Yeah. yeah. So and then we went to some other trips. We went. We came to Bukhara one time. Uh-huh. Bukhara night race. It was fantastic. Mm-hmm. I ran 10 kilometers in. 44 minutes. And what time of the year was it? It was early September. Early September. It's still hot. In night. It's no, still it, hot. Was, it was hot, but it was, you know, magical Windy. because it was night. Yeah. It started at 8 p.m. Uh-huh. And then we went to different places. This year we also went to Zamin again. We went to Zamin three times. This mm-hmm. year we had a lot of challenges. Mm-hmm. And again, what I, the most interesting part about marathon trips is that Running a marathon is the worst part. Yeah, you, you, not the worst part, but there are so much. There's so much more happening outside marathon mm-hmm. during the marathon trip. Mm-hmm. So we, I booked a car, a bus, minibus, to Zamin, mm-hmm. and so we came to Zamin, mm-hmm. and then there's Zamin National Park that you have to enter. That mm-hmm. where there is some police there, mm-hmm. and it turns out you cannot enter in a minibus. I knew that. Therefore, I planned. I asked the organizers, hey, are they going to make exceptions for us or, or not? Or do we, have to car, do we have to come by a normal taxi? They said, you will be allowed. You will be let, they'll let you in. We came, and then they didn't allow us. We stood there for four hours, and then we figured it out. We went by another car in Damas. Mm-hmm. So that's the first challenge. We went there, and then, um, so when I started counting, it turns out we had half the people than initially. You do the cal- I did calculations. I considered that some people would not come, but I didn't expect it to be half. Like mm-hmm. 50% is a lot. So people, ev- either everyone has to pay more or I have to pay for them. Mm-hmm. So that's like a problem, right? Problem after problem, there was some problem. And we had more food and water than we had to have. So you all also pay for that. So a lot of problems arise, mm-hmm. and you get to learn. It's real. Pro- it's project management in practice. You don't need to take a project management course if you can actually do projects, right? And one more thing that happened last year was we went to Zamin with sort of people. We had very great, amazing people. We had people from Yale, Stanford, you know, best mm-hmm. universities of the world, right? We went there. It was very cold. Mm-hmm. Very cold, freezing weather at night. And uh, by the way, before we slept, so there was some, you know, water, and then we put our bananas and some other food in there in the water, and then we slept. It was very hot. We even tried covering ourselves with sneakers, <laughs> with toilet paper, oh with socks, with bags. Oh Every, we tried everything. Didn't help. Yeah. It was oh freezing. Oh and a lot of people didn't bring their blankets. Yeah. So we had to give them. Yeah. I'm, I'm, sacrificing I'm, ourselves. Yeah. I'm, I'm, like, I'm just picturing this guy wrapped up in toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> so in a place where... In, in we, we, the, and the reason it was freezing was because uh-huh. we stayed in a tent, mm-hmm. in tents. So it was not a normal hotel. Uh-huh. I, we deliberately 
I chose this tent, so it's, mm -hmm. you know, experience adventure. Uh -huh. well, it was freezing. Uh -huh. And then we woke up, looked at the bananas. Uh -huh. Nothing is there. Are you kidding me? All food is gone. Yes. What happened? <laughs> I don't know. It probably no one, no one would be, no one would pick it up, uh -huh. you know, because everyone is rich. If people can afford going to Zamin mm -hmm. uh, during this time of the year, mm -hmm. they're probably mm -hmm. rich enough. Mm -hmm. It's probably, you know, how do you call it? My English. Is, is that not this is good. that like I'm guessing? Here's what I'm, I'm I'm guessing: some animals. No, no. At night came and how? had a feast. No, it was like. <laughs> What's the smaller version of a sea? A sea, a pond, a pond, a lake, a stream. You said a sea. Let's let's call it a stream. Uh -huh. So stream. it flew by. Uh, oh, it drowned in, in a stream. I yeah, see. You, stream. So you said it by the, by by your stream, and you slid inside the stream, and it yeah. was gone. We made it yeah. a little um, fridge, uh -huh. and then nothing was there in the oh. fridge. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. That's like, an experience, you know? Yeah, it is. It's not that we were sorry. We were happy. <laughs> we were laughing out. <laughs> you guys are out of your Everyone mind. is happy. Hey, we, go, we woke up at 7 a.m. in mm -hmm. the mountains. Uh -huh. Such a refreshing weather. Uh -huh. Let's eat some bananas, uh -huh. eat some hot dog before we run. Uh -huh. And then you look at it and it's not there. Uh -huh. <laughs> and yeah. then we started running. Mm -hmm. on it was an, also fantastic. On empty stomach. No food. No food, right? Or you guys had something for food. When you run, there are some places where they will oh, give yeah, you. Oh, yeah, yes, checkpoints, yes. You yeah, told checkpoints. Me. You told me about them. Mm -hmm. And then we basically came back. And then also, this year, we had misunderstanding with the driver. So mm -hmm. I found a driver on olex.us mm -hmm. platform. I booked a minibus. And then it turns out the person who I communicated with is a middleman, mm -hmm. not a driver himself. Mm -hmm. And then it turns out he asked more than the normal driver would. I was okay, but then because the uh, real driver stopped in before entering the national park, national park of Zamin, we agreed that we would give for 300,000 sums less because he didn't enter. He mm -hmm. didn't spend time or anything mm -hmm. or any resources like gas. And then we came back and then I said, here's the money I'm gonna give you. And he said, why this? I said, did we not agree? And he said, my colleague, the middleman, said that we agreed for X amount of money, and you're going to pay this. So we had a little argument, mm -hmm. and then I ended up giving the money. Mm -hmm. I don't want to make them, you know, uh, I want everything to be okay. Yeah, right? I see. He did the job, okay. But then you learn, right? Mm -hmm. you, you learn that there, there's some miscommunication happening. You, need, you, you, you learn to make everything clear and transparent. Mm -hmm. You start writing things down. Mm -hmm. You take notes. You, know, you learn different things, right? And also we started our new, so it was a club, but it was changing all the time because people are living to university, people are doing different stuff. Mm -hmm. And then from this year, we are making it more formal, more official. We're starting, we have opened our Telegram channel, our Instagram page, and we're starting to gather people who are perhaps applying to universities or just speak English, who like learning to run together and go to marathon trips together. It's called mm -hmm. Silk Road Runners. You can check it on Telegram, on Instagram. Mm -hmm. We haven't posted on Instagram, but there is a page. You can look it up, Silk Road Runners. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can put it in the description box if you guys are interested. You yep. just share the link with me after the podcast, right? I'd love to come and join you on this marathon, but I got a little back injury from heavy lifting, so I'm not allowed to run. No. I'm not gonna allowed to do any heavy lifting. I'm right now on mobility exercise. I'm doing rehab exercise, rehabilitation, mm -hmm. trying to get back on my feet. So, yeah. So I'm I've, I've pumped the brakes on sports, but I, I was as as you know crazy as they come when it comes to sports, right? I I used to deadlift 100 kilos, oh. you know, squat. The PR was 120 or something, which is not might not seem heavy, but it's heavy for <laughs> guys my size, 60, yeah. 65 kilos. That's almost twice my body size. Yeah, yeah. But then my back injury happened, so I had to you know take a break. Yeah, I'm also injured actually. That's why I, I haven't been playing for a year. Oh, what, what kind of injury you got? Uh, similar to this. <clears throat> How do you call it? I'm not sure. Is how it a herniated disc? Mm -hmm. A herniated disc is when a disc in your back bulges. Oh, yeah. you got a herniated disc. Is it, uh, where is it, in your neck or your... Yeah, my neck and uh, back also. You got two herniated discs. Yeah. And, and how big are they? 
not not that big, but uh -huh. I, I, it hurts sometimes. Did, it hurts. did you do an MRI? What did you do an MRI? MRI scan? MRI scan? I, I did it four years ago. Mm -hmm. We did a rehab, and then I didn't mm -hmm. have time to check it again. Mm -hmm. it still, sometimes. But hurts. they don't bother you anymore, right? They do when I uh -huh. play. Mm -hmm. Because you know, I play rugby, mm -hmm. and it's a really, really dangerous. Uh, oh, it is. Con full of contact, mm -hmm. very dangerous. You can start fighting anytime, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you basically get to tackle mm -hmm. very big guys, 100 kilo, 90 mm -hmm. kilo guys. Uh -huh. Okay, just a word of advice: you have to be careful with your neck injury because it's more dangerous than your lower back injury. I've heard that because it's closer to your brain. Yeah. Right. When you start getting pains, your back pain, your neck pain, what it does is absorbs all the shock and spreads mm. it all over your body. Yeah. You feel pain in your arms, in your fingers, in your toes, in places where the, you, you're not injured. Okay. Yeah. So you, you gotta watch your back. You gotta watch your neck, buddy. You gotta yeah, take care of yourself. All right. So we did quite a quite a bit of talking about extracurriculars. So. You are, you know, aside from running marathons, you also run channels on social media. Yeah. So would you like to talk a little about your social media experience as well? So uh, how long have you been active on social media? And what kind of content do you post on social media? And if you guys are interested to know more about this guy, we'll be sure to put, put all your links in the description box so you guys can go and check him out on social media. Yep, so I started out in 2021 by opening my channel called Lifsha. It was called initially called Lifsha Entrance mm -hmm. Records mm -hmm. because you know I was applying to universities and I thought it would be my entrance records because you know, I knew or I expected myself to get in. So it was entrance records. Now it's Lifsha Might. You can look it up. Mm -hmm. I started sharing resources that are related to university admissions. I started sharing an acceptance rate, different colleges, why go to university, different resources. But then I also started making it more personal. I started sharing my own experience. Hey, I'm doing SAT, mm -hmm. I'm getting this score. Mm -hmm. Next week I'll get 100 mm -hmm. score points more. Mm -hmm. Next week comes mm -hmm. 20 scores minus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you get less score because it's unpredictable, right? And mm -hmm. people liked it. It was one of the uh, earliest channels related to admissions mm -hmm. on Telegram. But then I started getting more serious. I started making it more professional, started sharing books. Like one of the books that I shared was Man's Search for Meaning mm -hmm. by Viktor Frankl. I recommend you read, by the way, mm -hmm. if you are. Have you read it? I did read it. I read it in one, in one sitting. Well, the entire book. amazing, yeah. Uh, one of the best books I've well, ever what's, read. What are some of your biggest takeaways from this book? Meaning does not magically come to you. You get to give meaning to life. Mm -hmm. You give life, you make, you give meaning to your life by adopting responsibility, mm -hmm. by sometimes leaving responsibility, for example. So it basically describes the concentration camp during the Nazi regime mm -hmm. in the World War II. And it shows how people survived in the concentration camp. Mm -hmm. Right, you know you're going to die. Mm -hmm. Every second person you knew when you came to the camp is dead. Why are you living? Mm -hmm. Why do you not commit a suicide? Mm -hmm. He talked to those people. He asked them why. Mm -hmm. and he found that you give life, you give meaning to your don't life. Don't you think? Don't you think there just might be survival instinct at work? Maybe it's just your instincts. It Where has, does that come from? Has has and ha, doesn't really have much to do with your philosophy on life, right? It's just it, you're trying to survive. Yeah, yeah completely different. It, yeah, it, it gives it, it everyone. Yeah. So when you read a book, you're not reading. You're not reading to learn about the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. You learn about the hero's journey because you want to get a good mark. What you're actually trying to accomplish is, when you're reading, you're imagining yourself as a protagonist or some hero in there. And you get to see what would happen if you acted this way. And I put myself in the positions of those people. And I found that we share very similar philosophies. And is it because I follow the writer's philosophy mm -hmm. or because humans in general have similar patterns? Mm -hmm. Yes, it goes back to survival instinct mm -hmm. in the time. Mm -hmm. 
but different people can have different interpretations, and that's why people have to read more the full versions rather than the summaries. Mm -hmm. Summaries give you conclusions, but conclusion is easy. You have to discover what happens when you actually read it. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. You have to explore it yourself. Yeah. So you're like an explorer out there, out yeah. in the jungle, out in the open. Yeah, so totally. th There are traps, there are uh, dangerous animals, there are big trees, bushes, right? And you have to navigate your way through all those challenges. Yeah. And that's all the fun of reading the whole yes. book or watching an entire movie or listening to a podcast like this one. And back to your point about meaning, right? Here's my take on meaning. And I, I think my philosophy is very similar to what you just described. Meaning is something you create through hard work. Meaning is the product of your labor. Yeah. And that's what I'm usually you know, telling the message I'm sending our staff here. So if you want your life to be meaning, then you have to work your face off. Only then you appreciate life. Yeah. right? Because through that effort, through that hardship, do you come to realize and learn a lot about life, have experiences, and, and create that meaning. Yeah. So meaning is created through effort. Yeah, right? and that's one thing that I... Uh, I listened to the podcast that you had with Bob Arjan, uh -huh. and he expressed his desire to retire his parents. Mm -hmm. I think that's a natural human instinct to retire, you know, to mm -hmm. allow parents to do what they want, to rest. Mm -hmm. They've been working so hard for such a long time. Mm -hmm. But I have a different take on this. I, I don't want to retire them. Mm -hmm. Why? I believe that if they retire, at least my father, let's say, mm -hmm. Will he be, what will he be doing? Mm -hmm. Will he rest, mm -hmm. lie there, not doing anything, mm -hmm. reading the news, reading mm -hmm. politics? Mm -hmm. it, 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 I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. But my, I fear that if you don't have meaning in your life, you mm -hmm. may die. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's written already mm -hmm. when you will die. But I believe there's some sort of trend or pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this famous book, I'm not sure about the name of the author, Ablomov. He lies in his place all the time. He has money, he has servants, he doesn't even go out to eat. He, go, he eats it in his sofa, mm -hmm. where he lies. And he doesn't have any meaning at all, and he dies. Right? I don't want my parents to die, obviously. I, I'm not, maybe because the inference is wrong, maybe I'm making a very wrong conclusion mm -hmm. that people, if people don't have meaning, they will die. But I believe that if they keep working, they don't have to work much, but they should to some extent work. Because mm -hmm. if they don't, they won't have meaning in, in their life. And the same, I don't understand the people who want to go to bitches and lie there every day. Mm -hmm. I don't see myself doing that. Mm -hmm. that be, that's why perhaps it's because my, of my temperament, because I like fast, I like taking fast actions. Mm -hmm. But I don't see meaning in that. Uh, we're on the same page here, buddy. Trust me, we're on the same page. So I, sometimes when I see my dad or mom doing some chores around the house, you know, I don't feel like helping them. And most people would think I'm a, being a bad son, yeah. but I'm not. It's those chores that give their life meaning. Yeah. Why take them away from them? It would be a disservice to them. Exactly. Why take them away from them? My mom is proud of the fact that she cooks for me. She's proud of the fact that she helps me with my laundry. Yeah. She must be proud of the fact that she's contributing to my, you know, you know success, success or whatever. And uh, people might think that I'm too dependent on my parents or for, you know, not being responsible. No, 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 no. They actually like that. They like the fact that they are a meaningful part of your life. Yes. Right? They're, they're connected. So, yeah, I'm not, I don't t t subscribe to that idea that you should re retire your parents when they're 50 or when they're 40, when they're 30. No, you, your parents need a job. <laughs> yeah. We all need a job. We all need some kind of a chase in life, something we're chasing, something to keep us busy, right? Right. And, <clears throat> right, right. How about podcasts? Do you like listening to podcasts? Who, who are some of your favorite podcasters? Is Ad Astra Muse on your list? <laughs> uh, to be frank, I don't watch a lot of podcasts. Uh -huh. Like, if I see too many reels, mm -hmm. Uh, too many parts of the video mm -hmm. of the podcast mm -hmm. on Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, I just go to the podcast. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wasting. Uh, I'm spending too much time. Let's just 
watch the full podcast because it keeps appearing to me because I'm mm-hmm. liking it, right? Like one of the podcasts that I liked most was Joe Rogan Experience mm-hmm. when he had uh, Jordan Peterson in it. Mm-hmm. They oh, basically man. talked about one of the things that we talked about, which is uh, not being weak, uh-huh. not being docile, right? Uh-huh. You have to put in the work. You have to be. You have to have some sort of aim. You should have a purpose in life, mm-hmm. and then you should work towards achieving it. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of things that they discuss, but Joe Rogan Experience is one of the favorite pos- it, podcasts. It, it is, say. it is. Jordan Peterson podcast is so dense. Yeah. Right. It, it, it just to understand what they're talking about, you have to have a certain level of intelligence yourself. You can't just sit and listen to that podcast. Your mind would crumble yeah. before you. Because I, I, I sometimes listen to some of his speeches and I think to myself, all right, if. God ever created a super intelligent, sentient being, those people would be one of them, some of them, you know, some of them. Because the level of consciousness, the level of mindfulness, the, the, the level of sophistication, the richness in their thinking, it's just... It's inspiring, right? And again, and just I, I honestly here feel like uh, when you listen to them, you feel like chimp. You feel yeah. like you feel like an ape, right? You can't articulate your thoughts. Yeah, you, yeah. you think you can speak, but it's not the speech. And, or you say you like Joe Rogan, right? There's this. I have personal recommendation for you. You have to check it out. And probably watch this podcast yourself. It's the one with Naval Ravikant. I watched some part of it. It was fantastic. Yeah. Please didn't. watch the entire podcast. Yeah. You're missing uh, out on missing out so much. The yeah. Naval Ravikant podcast. That that part. I a quick fun fun fact. I watched that podcast probably fifty times oh. on repeat. That podcast literally mapped out my life. Right? That was like the starting point of my self development and and success journey, yeah. so to speak. Right. That's that's like where things wh- wh- how things got started. With that podcast, what was what set the ball rolling for me, right? Listening to that podcast, he, he breaks down every, literally everything, meaning of life, what happiness is, why having too many desires is bad, and talks about technology, jobs, there's a little bit of business, yeah. and he talks about why you should be an entrepreneur, right? Which he describes as a modern day, modern day gladiatorship, I guess what's, what, that, that's what he called on the podcast. There are so many mind-blowing, mind-blowing realizations I learned from that podcast. And if it were not for that podcast, honestly, I, I, I don't imagine where my life, I can't imagine where my life would be. So you need some of those you know, intellectual conversations yeah. to rewire, rewire your brain, to think in a way that gets you ahead in life, Right. So, because so, that, that, that's probably one of the reasons why podcasting is a big industry now. Yeah, it's a conversation yeah. of the two people who at least try to listen to each other, mm-hmm. to express their thoughts. And one of the ways, one of the things that people get most impressed about is the way they say it, right? Mm-hmm. It's their articulation and expression. And the reason that they're able to express mm-hmm. their thoughts in such a clear, articulate convincing and effective and memorable way mm-hmm. is because they wrote everything down mm-hmm. to a paper. Mm-hmm. Jordan Peterson, most of the things that he says, he says it so well because he wrote it before. He worked on one of the books that he wrote, Maps of Meaning, for around 20 years. There, he basically wrote everything that was in his mind that was relevant to the book, obviously, to a book. Mm-hmm. He wrote it. Mm-hmm. And now, because he has written it all mm-hmm. and made it clear in his mind and tried to sharpen it, was using more precise words, mm-hmm. more precise ways of expression, he's now able to tell them in such a memorable story format. Mm-hmm. So if you want to be great, if you want to be great at articulation, you have to write. And you have to write a lot, you have to edit your writing mm-hmm. a lot. And one of the ways, one of the reasons, in fact, the most important reason why I run channels is because I write in them. I tend, I get to write a lot. Mm-hmm. I read almost, I read a long post 
almost every week. And it's not just a short mm -hmm. post. It's, it's this size, mm -hmm. and I get to sharpen it. I get to make it more concise, more precise. Mm -hmm. And it also helps other people to so, see how I view the world. So what do you write about? I don't have any specific um, topic. Mm -hmm. I just write whatever comes to my mind. Not whatever. Obviously, mm -hmm. I tend to filter it all through. But mostly, if I have uh, an argument with a taxi driver, mm -hmm. I can write it in a story format. Mm -hmm. Recently, I had a problem with a taxi driver. So I went out of the metro. So there's like two kilometer distance from the metro to my home. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes go by walk, sometimes by taxi. Mm -hmm. I stopped the taxi. Hey, uh, uncle, would you mind leaving me there for 5,000 soms? And then he said in response, if you wait for eight hours, the bus will arrive, kind of mocking or insulting me. Mm -hmm. And while I didn't react because mm -hmm. I'm not an emotional person, I tried analyzing it on my channel. Mm -hmm. On what premise, on what reason would he say that? Is it because he's so rich, mm -hmm. he's driving a taxi, he's, he's a tra taxi driver, so probably not that rich. And plus it wouldn't give him the privilege either, the right to insult people who are from low income families, right? And there were some other reasons, but you get to analyze the normal people, you get to analyze the patterns. And when you keep that, you can have a list of memories. Mm -hmm. You have a diary. Mm -hmm. Isn't that fantastic to look back in your life mm -hmm. and see how cringy <laughs> and interesting and weird you yeah. were in yeah. the past yeah. and how far you have come? Uh -huh. When I read my first or second post that I wrote, mm -hmm. it was, you know, there is nothing insightful there. There's nothing interesting there. But because I kept writing, because I kept refining how I view the world, because I was flexible and open-minded and kept recording it actually, I could see the progress. And when you see some sort of progress, the rest will be easier. Mm -hmm. Like, what was the quote by a famous qu uh, philosopher? I'm not going to name because he's a bit controversial. Having a high speed is not important. Mm -hmm. It's getting to that speed. It's the growth. It's the speed mm -hmm. with which you rise. It's the acceleration. And when you notice that there is some acceleration that already happened, that will pave the path forward. Let me guess the philosopher. Is he a modern day philosopher? <laughs> he works at MIT, right? No. Not MIT. Uh, me, it's, you said Sam Harris. It, it no, must not be Sam, Sam Harris. Not, not it's, Sam not, Harris. it's not Sam Harris because he's a controversial Everyone right? here knows him. He's a very funny guy uh -huh. and serious guy at times. Okay, funny and serious at times. Who fits that bill? Very charismatic. Charismatic. Donald Trump? Uh, 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 the most popular <laughs> after him, but yeah. Yeah. The most popular guy after Donald Trump is... Uh, honestly, it's hard to guess. All right, sure. It's not hard. <laughs> it's not that hard? He's bold. He's bold. Let's finish on this uh, part. <laughs> okay, he's bold. Write in comments if you mm. recognize the guy. Um, bold, funny. Joe, Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan. So yeah. it's bold. More charismatic. More charismatic than Joe Rogan. Who can be possibly more charismatic? So than write that? in comments your guesses. You said controversial. Let's get some engagement. <laughs> yeah. Sure, sure, yeah. sure, sure. Let's leave it there. If anyone listens to him, uh -huh. they will immediately understand who I'm talking about. Bold, uh, oh, okay. Can I just know their nationality? I'm guessing they're American. Nationality. Nationality. They must be American. He, he, he was born in America. Uh -huh. In Indiana. Mm -hmm. In Indiana, he, so he's a comedian. Is he Iranian comedian? No. Or Egyptian comedian? There's an Egyptian comedian, but I don't know his name. He's very famous. He's very famous. He's bald. Mahatma Gandhi? <laughs> no. No, he was born in, the, in Indiana, right? He, he's good with interacting with girls. Interacting with girls, bold. Oh my <laughs> right God! Right guesses. Like. Yes, sure. I think I think I got the idea, yeah. but come on, this is this is not a this censorship. Okay, we need to censor this part of the podcast. Okay, this is yeah. Things got a little adult let's here. Keep, let's keep the viewership in place. Okay, sure. Now we talk quite a bit about podcasting. One other thing I want to ask is: I know you go to university, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, so you're interested in technology, and I sort of read your, I didn't, I stumbled upon your blog post about Sam Altman, ChatGPT, right, AI. 
So what do you think about AI? So uh, you think AI, because it, it's a clearly a controversial topic, right? If someone has been experimenting with AI personally, you've been using it uh, for your studies. And I'm guessing you use it for work as well now. So you're working for a company that w deals with money exchange, right? And, and are yeah. they using AI? Is AI part of the workplace? No, I use AI for oh. my own pursuits. For pursuits, right. So wh where do you think this AI thing is headed? You think is the beginning of the end? Um, I don't think it, there is some end near. Oh. But I believe that automation in its basic sense means mm -hmm. some work will be done by AI. Mm -hmm. And that means that some work that is done by humans mm -hmm. will be done by AI. And that means mm -hmm. some humans will lose their jobs. Mm -hmm. But there's a flip side to it. It means that the people who use AI, who are good with using AI, who can produce very good output, who can prompt well, they get to be, they get to enjoy all the benefits. It's like being in the elite when there's a wide inequality, which there is now. Mm -hmm. So the gap, the inequality gap is widening. Mm -hmm. And if you don't want to stay in the lower part, in the low income part. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say that they are bad. I'm just saying, if you want to stay in the top, you have to be able to be prompt to ask AI questions. And I think it was Voltaire who said, if you want to judge a man, look at his, look at his questions. Mm -hmm. And now is the time when questions are becoming the most important. If you can question, not, not question a book in the sense that we talked about, but ask questions that are precise. You know what output you want to get. You know how it looks like. You know what format it's going to have. For example, if you want to generate an image of Donald Trump being shot, you can write a prompt, a specific prompt. It, it's different. You may write different prompts, but if you keep writing, if you keep asking questions and sharpening your tool, if you can ask a question from AI, you will be good in the society. Mm -hmm. There are some jobs appearing, I have searched a lot, called prompt engineering. He literally sits down and asks questions from AI. And that's what normally a lot of jobs do. In my job, all I do is ask, ask from AI. Like there's mm -hmm. almost nothing else other than asking from AI. Mm -hmm. Obviously I get to infer a lot of things, but other than that, it's mostly asking questions. If you can just ask questions, relevant questions, you will be good in this society. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, alternative, if you're not open-minded, mm -hmm. if you're not responsive to how AI is going to impact, you will perhaps be eliminated. Yeah, you're going to get left behind. I mean, eliminate is a strong word. <laughs> you're gonna, probably going to get le left behind. You'll stay at the bottom of the food just chain. It's a softer version, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Right. If it was a journal, it mm. would be um, left out or a mm -hmm. layoff, it would be. You yeah. know. Amazon has laid off 500 workers, uh -huh. eliminated. Yeah. Right. So you got to get good at writing prompts. Yes. Right? That's, but this is, AI is not something we should be fighting, we should be joining forces with AI. Um, so I brought, brought up this topic, and I'm glad you mentioned that aspect of AI, benefits of AI, because there are a lot of teachers in our you know, industry space that are still skeptical of AI because they think it might be taking away our thinking abilities, thinking skills, because now you can generate essays, reports on AI, you know, do much of the you know, thinking, outsource much of the thinking and reasoning. And, and that would then you know, mean that you're not actively exercising your own abilities, which eventually you're going to you know, start you know, losing because you're not training it. Yeah. So th that's this concern and worry people, teachers have about AI. It kind of holds them back from what they, what's, what's inevitable, right? Yeah. The, this AI revolution is happening. It's here to stay. So you, you join forces with it. You don't fight it, really. You know, when the first books appeared in our world, mm -hmm. people were skeptical about mm -hmm. it. People would say, hey, the memories mm -hmm. will get worse. People mm -hmm. will stop memorizing, will stop remembering the things. Mm -hmm. It's going to have a bad impact. And the same goes with calculators. People will stop doing basic calculations. 
And so there are different things. Perhaps we'll, we are not able to draw a similar analog. But what is true for all of them, a clear parallel is if a person did not read, he was left behind when the books appeared. When the ledgers were the financial accounts, for example, the debt, loans, uh, borrowings, different financial accounts were appeared, if you couldn't uh, use those, you would be left behind in the finance sector, in the business sector, right? And when the calculations came out, if you couldn't use the calculation calculator, you would be left behind. And the same goes with AI. Perhaps it will have different consequences, but the, what the trend indicates is if you're not able to use it, perhaps you'll be left behind. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> for sure. Because simply a teacher who uses AI is much quicker in checking students' response, is much quicker yeah. and giving, at giving feedback and much more accurate, right? So, so they just simply have an advantage, competitive edge, because yeah. they know how to use this technology, leverage it to their benefit, to their advantage. Right, very fascinating stuff, AI, right? Yeah. It is, it really is. So, we, wow, it's, we hit the two hours. It's a little, little over two hours. We hit the two hour mark. Now, to wrap up this podcast, I usually ask our guests some questions on philosophy. We, we did plenty, plenty of talking, rambling about philosophy earlier on the podcast. Yep. But there's still, you know, we have a tradition of asking these three questions. I have a tradition of asking these three questions of our guests, and I'd love to hear your answers to these questions too. So my first question is, how would you in few words or lines put your philosophy on life? So well, what's the thing that's guiding you right now? What's the thing at the, the core, at the center of your existence? Three words. Mm -hmm. Belief, speed, and mm. reflection. Belief, speed, and re reflection. Got it. So why do these three words resonate with you? Can we make it uh, a little longer? Uh, for sure. For sure. No time limit. Don't worry about that. Yeah. So when I came to Tashkent, I saw people doing different projects. Mm -hmm. One would do MUNs. Mm -hmm. One would do TED, different kinds of projects, right? They could pursue their passion project. They could open an extracurricular club at school. But our school didn't have it. I thought we would. And I would look at Westminster Lyceum. They would have this, you know, different student union, different clubs. Interesting. But we don't have it. And what people have to understand is things are not going to magically happen. We have to make them happen. We have to have a catalyst mindset, a person who can start to make things happen. You can open a club. I could open a student union, or I could open some other clubs. For example, we didn't have as many MUNs, let's say, and I gave an initiative for our peers, for my friends, let's do MUN ourselves. We didn't have sponsors, we didn't have money. We didn't know any learning centers that could mm -hmm. help us. Once we gathered the team, we had the belief, which I said was important. And then after belief, once the team was gathered, then what's important is speed. I tell this all the time. Speed is the most important thing. Once you have decided, you have to act fast. Napoleon, what Napoleon would do is the following. He would gather all, not all, but the most smart, the smartest academicians, the professors, at Academy of Sciences, the smartest people he knew of, to his palace. And they would plan, they would map out their invasion. For example, they invaded Egypt, different countries, right? They mapped out a plan to invade Russia as well, as we know from the history. He would study all the possibilities, like chess, like in chess. If the horse moves this way, what's going to happen? If not, what's going to happen? He would study all the ways. But once he has decided, he would do things quickly. 
he would not have a second doubt. The plan is there, we will do it. And what happens to a lot of people is, oh, let's start M U N gathering a team. He, I, I wrote to him, I wrote to them, I wrote to other people, didn't respond next week. Where is the M U N announcement? Oh, I, I wrote to them, I wrote to them, didn't respond, didn't, uh, decided not to do. If the things are done quickly, fast, if you decide it, then you should do it fast. And people are slow. If, it, if he doesn't respond, write back. If not, go to the next person. There are so many people who can help you. In our case, we didn't have any sponsors. We would, our girl in the financial manager in our MUN would write to all of the companies, and guess who she got the sponsorship from? From Montella, from Safia, and from other companies. Like, it's hard to get money from them, right? They are very scrupulous with their money, but we got it. Companies are willing to give you, if you can just pitch the product, pitch what you're uh, going to do. At the very least, you don't have to indicate the meaning. Say, hey, we're doing it for the great cost. Let's help me. Please help us. They will help you. So you need to be very fast once you have established the belief. If you're, you should not be slow. You have to act fast. And last, third, once the thing has been done or accomplished or not done, we have to reflect on what happened. What was the thing that I could have done faster? What was the thing that I should not have done? Maybe I should not have talked to that guy in that manner. Maybe I should have been more soft because she's a girl. Maybe I should have been more strict because he's a boy. Different things, you have to reflect on the experiences. And then once the reflection has been done, the project is in the past, you start a different project, you get a belief, a team, and then you operate in this uh, speed very fast, and then you reflect in the next cycle. Wow. So you guys, that's pretty much sums up your philosophy right now, right? Yeah. So you have a belief, idea, you act on it instantly, yeah. immediately, you reflect, you rest, and start all over. Yeah. And belief is also a common purpose. Mm -hmm. Belief that you have, you share a common history or common future. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That's, I, I especially like the part where you talk about, you know, speed. I wish people were quicker. <laughs> I wish. Like, and yeah. sometimes, because I see that happen a lot at work, in the workplace, I you reach out to different people. Sometimes I get a response, sometimes I don't. I, you know, when I texted you, right, you didn't respond right away. I, did, I, did I text you again then? I don't exactly remember. You did? You did? You did. I, I don't, sometimes the podcast guests, I, I reach out to people and there's no response. I don't wait for them to respond, right? I text them back again and again and again. I need to yeah. have that person on the podcast. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The same with sometimes we have lights not working or Wi-Fi is down. And I have Ali Shard, my partner here, running partner, my business partner. I have him call an ele the electrician or sometimes the Wi-Fi pr provider to have technician to come down here and fix the Wi-Fi router. And he, he's like, well, they said they'd come. They probably forgot. I say, okay, call him again. Yeah, you can call, force them. Call him again. Call him again. I said, okay. So he, he said he must be busy. Okay, then he's busy. Call another guy. Yeah. But Wi-Fi needs to be fixed now. I need the Wi-Fi. <laughs> and it's possible. I, I need electricity. Exactly. Because if guy, one guy's not coming, there's another guy who wants to do it. Yeah. Right? So you just have to be fast. You have to be a little demanding. Right? Yeah. Sure. And, and my next question here is, what's one piece of advice you have for your 16-year-old self or all the other 16-year-olds out there? People who are 16, 15, who are just, who just getting into this game of admission, life, success, who just got introduced to the real world. Uh, expand right. your horizon, be open-minded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't dream of having a high IELTS or SAT score mm -hmm. or getting into Harvard. Dream of something bigger. You can always dream bigger. Mm -hmm. Of course, mm -hmm. you can make it more realizable. Mm -hmm. If you're reading, uh, an SAT passage along, uh, of the old SAT. Read something serious. You can read basic economics to start, mm -hmm. and then you can go to literature, mm -hmm. War and Peace, or mm -hmm. Dostoevsky. Mm -hmm. 
Idiot. I, uh, Idiot is one of the most favorite books that I have. And then you can go to some more serious stuff like Nietzsche and philosophy. And then you go to Nassim Taleb, and then you realize that Nietzsche was uh, talking shit, <laughs> <laughs> that everything he said was useless. Uh -huh. And then you also realize that, according to him, economists are charlatans, mm -hmm. that they just talk, they predict, mm -hmm. and none of the predictions come true. Because mm -hmm. if they're so good at predictions, why aren't they rich? They could invest their money in the stock, uh, stock market and become rich, right? But they aren't. Most of the economists are not rich. If there is any great rich economist, mm -hmm. it's probably because he's famous, you know, mm -hmm. he gives uh, expensive lectures. Mm -hmm. But in general, their predictions may not be true. Uh, so you, oh, you have different, you know, kind, sometimes disappointment, sometimes realization. Be flexible and dream bigger. Read better books, read mm -hmm. books by great men and great women. Mm -hmm. Talk to people, apply to jobs that you're not qualified for. I applied to a job as a manager of a creative director. As a, I initially applied as an intern, mm -hmm. but then I turned to a manager mm -hmm. because I was working fantastically well, you know. Mm -hmm. So apply to a job you're not qualified for, read books you're not yet capable of reading, mm -hmm. and explore, be open-minded, don't be limited, mm -hmm. which what I actually did. Yeah. So I think I'm good. I don't regret any choice that I made. Just get off your couch and live life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Talk to people. Talk to people. Talk to people. Try living life, your life to the full. That's, that, yep. I wish more 16 year olds out there had this sort of mindset. Okay. And you build that mindset through experiences. Yes. You build that mindset through experience. And you, you can't have those experiences unless you go out there and try and explore. Right. Okay. And don't be afraid to explore. Good. Yeah. One last question I got for today is. I'm going to tell you a little secret. Right now, this podcast is being watched oh, really? by your 29-year-old self. I bet your 29-year-old self is watching this podcast to look back in time. Right? You can actually wave at him right now. Hi. <laughs> 29 year What's one message you have for your 20-year-old self? What's something you'd want to tell your 29-year-old self? In one sentence, it would be, it's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. If you do what you're doing, if you keep believing and keep working, you'll pull it off, you'll pull everything off. I see so many people being ambitious or not being ambitious. But one thing that makes me unique, I don't want to brag, but is if I'm ambitious, I also try to back it up through hard work. And I am trying to work hard, I'm trying to be ethical, if I'm getting a salary from my employer, I'm trying to work very hard in order to make sure that uh, he's satisfied. So it's just a matter of time that I become mm -hmm. successful, mm -hmm. rich, have the person I want to be around. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to retire my parents again. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna. Pr it's probably not going to change, uh -huh. and get a life. <laughs> yeah, just get a life. Yeah, that's. Very interesting. I wonder how your 29-year-old self is going to react to that message. Yeah, with cringe, <laughs> I guess. No, not really. I not, think, not really. I, I think he would be saying, "I always knew that you <laughs> you would be successful." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that reaction. Uh, and one thing about that, there is this famous philosopher and mathematician. Uh -huh. His name is Rand Descartes. Mm -hmm. He said, "The only thing." that you can control in this universe is your mind. Mm -hmm. Think about it. You cannot control your hands. Mm -hmm. You cannot control how you are going to look in five minutes. Mm -hmm. Will you live after five years? You cannot control it. But one thing you can control is your mind. Mm -hmm. And if your mind is not on your team, mm -hmm. who, will, who will root for you? Mm -hmm. Your parents, they may feel they're rooting, but the advice they give may be different. It's again feelings, but you know what is what you can make yourself believe that mm -hmm. you have the potential. Don't doubt yourself. So that, that's what actually uh, my bio profile on Telegram states: Is your mind on your team? Mm -hmm. Your mind has to be on your team. 
You should absolutely and utterly believe that you will win, that you will pull it off, regardless of the challenges, of the struggles, of the disappointments that come in your way. No comments. No comments. Sometimes no comment is better than making a comment. That's actually something I learned from having had so many podcasts. Sometimes I feel the urge to say something, but then I think to myself, okay, you just should leave it at that because it, it can't be said better. Yeah, silence, it can be silence is amazing. Yeah, it is. All right, Mr. Levsha, we, that, that was one of the best podcasts we've ever had, okay? We, I usually have our editor guy rate the podcast once we're you know, done shooting, say, yeah. that was my top two, that was my top three, that was my top one. The guy who just walked out, he's gonna be back and share his impressions about the podcast before we put this podcast out and get some feedback from people, yeah. right? I, I don't care what he thinks, but th this is in top, top three. <laughs> it, indeed it was, it was, was one amazing. of the most fruitful conversations. It, it was, it was. It was very intellectually challenging right? and uh, intellectually stimulating. That's the word I had in mind. And quite aspirational. I loved it. I, I personally love meeting people like you and sharing in this energy, right? And it's not just the thoughts. It's just the energy, more of that energy. Because when you're in a small town, there's not much going on around. And seeing that energy in young people is, is a breath of fresh air. I wish yeah. we had, more young people had that. I miss, really miss that energy. And so and I'm really appreciative of you coming here on the podcast, traveling all the way from Tashkent to share your experiences, your stories, your advice, and your, your take on everything. That means a lot to me. Actually, that's one of the things why I mm -hmm. keep my channels open, why I create content. Mm -hmm. You know, back in like one or two years ago, I would watch sometimes what the Uzbek content producers are producing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hilarious. Mm -hmm. It's cringe. It's useless. It's meaningless. I don't want to complain, but one thing that I have realized is you have to be a catalyst. You have to make sure that you do not wait for things to happen. You can make it happen. If you do not like what they are producing, start producing yourself. Start creating the videos yourself. I have started my philosophy page. I had around 39,000 people last year watching. Turns out, if you create content, if it's consistent, if it's useful, you can overtake those producers. Mm -hmm. They do not, they are there not because they are good. Perhaps that's a part of it, but I do not believe they are there because they are the best producers. You can make a better content, but you have to stop your limiting beliefs Go out there and start creating content. You can make it better. You can change mm -hmm. the mainstream idea about content producers, about bloggers. Totally agree. 100%. 100%. This, this channel is a living proof, living yeah. testament to what he just said. People, we started this year, 2024, actually 2023, December 31. You, could, you, know, you, you might say just this year. Six, seven months in, we have 10 plus K followers on YouTube. Whoa. 10, 10 plus K followers. That's a lot. Yeah. People will mm -hmm. watch it if you create it and if you make it interesting mm -hmm. and if you reflect again. Thanks for inviting, sir. Yeah. All right, guys. If you enjoyed today's podcast, you know what to do. Go subscribe, turn on the notification bell, hit the like button, and leave us your comments in the comment section below. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace, everyone.